First World Order Radio, final lead, final lead. We are on the air, no doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday at 8 o'clock, we are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in levels in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages for us to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. You have to activate the pioneer man in which I produce this black chemical called melanin. <laughs> Peace. Once again, you back with Dr. Aline Bay show. And tonight, the show is going to go into Black Devils, Boulay, and Assassination, MLK. Um, we did part one last week, and we're going to continue on with the information. Um, before we get started, I'm going to bring in my co-host. Brother L, are you here? Yes, sir. About the peace, God. All right, peace, God. Tonight, we're going to get into it. Um, but before we get into it, I want to say we got some announcements, and so I got to, sh- you know, shout those out before we get into it. Um, right. We got the t- cruise coming up. Um, that's United Washington Tour um, Cruise 2013, March 21st through the 25th. If you have not already got your reservations, I suggest that you do so. You definitely want to um, get that popping, all right? It's going to be the Royal Caribbean, Liberty of the Sea. And um, for anyone who want to know, um, the information, you can definitely call at 252-257-3588 or go to our website, www.dralimelbay.com. That's D-R-A-L-I-M-E-L-B-E-Y.com and go to um, calendar and up-and-coming events. <coughs> and you can find it on there. And this cruise to the pyramids, Cozumel, and we're going to try to get Chesanisa up in there, Cabal, or Tulum, one of those, and um, it's going to be all-inclusive, so you definitely need to be there. There's no doubt about it. You need to be there, and um, for the reservation number, is 1-800-465-3595. That's 3595, and the group ID, 688-4345, and the reservation name is Washington or El Bay. So you definitely want to um, get on that. Uh, matter of fact, um, it's going to be even all the way up until March the 20th. If you need more time in order to get it in, as long as you get it in, as long as they got rooms, you can go. So check us out on that. Um, as a matter of fact, we also got um, the Helen Wings Institute online courses in which they're going to Qigong, Tai Chi, Reiki, Pranic Healing, uh, reflexology, acupressure, tantra, Kriya yoga, kundalini yoga, herbology, herbalism, and much, much more. All dealing with the esoteric and metaphysical sciences and principles. 
and that is every Sunday and Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And for those who are interested, y'all can um, hit us up on our email at w um, at Healing Wings Online at yahoo.com. That's Healing Wings Online at yahoo.com. That's H E A L I N G W I N G S O N L I N E at yahoo.com. And you can check us out there uh, for those who are interested on the online courses. And we also have law classes too. Um, in which that is going to be every Monday and Thursday starting February the 7th. And y'all can definitely um, come on in on that. We're going to talk from everything from indigenous, aboriginal, title to history, constitution, amorality, equity, law. Everything is going to be involved. So. Right, so so for those who are interested, definitely um um come on in and check that out. All right, so um let's get into this information. All right, we can deal with Martin Luther King, and um, we're gonna get right on back up into it. All right, so we know that Martin Luther King's um, family and his attorney William F. Pepper won a civil trial that found the United States agencies guilty in the wrongful death of Martin Luther King, and this trial was in 1999. And King's family um, issued forth a lawsuit um, against Lord Jowers, who was the owner of Jim's Grill, in which that was right around the corner from the Lorraine Motel, where Martin Luther King was assassinated at, as well as other unknown conspirators. All right? And it's the only trial ever conducted in the assassination of Dr. King. And the King's family and uh, Mr. Pepper alleged that Dr. King's speech calling upon America to end the Vietnam War, which was called Beyond Vietnam, a time to break silence, and his plans for a 500,000 campaign for Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1968 was a threat to dominant and fascist political factions within the United States um, government. And a matter of fact, um, if you get the book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, it was written in 1967 by Dr. Martin Luther King, um, matter of fact, it was his fourth book and his last book before his assassination. But Dr. King always been revolutionary in a sense because he said freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And he wrote this in a letter from Birmingham Jail, um, April the 16th, 1963. Now, in his 1967 book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, he states this, that these are revolutionary times, and all over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression, and out of the wounds of a frail world, new system of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the earth are raising up as never before. The people who sit or sat in darkness have seen a great light. We in the West must support these revolutions. Now, that was very revolutionary, you know, and so because of that, um, it was felt that he had underlying meanings, I guess, or ties to, I should say, to communism. And that was some of the principles in which that was always shouted out, you know, from individuals within government such as the FBI head at the time, Gay go over. Now, August the 19th, 2003, there was an issue in the Final Call magazine, or of newspaper, I should say, in which that uh, would actually would go down in history as one of the most controversial issues ever, in which that on the front page it stated, Ye shall know the truth, SCLC, King's family seeks to set the record straight about King's assassination. Now, Eric Muhammad, who's the son of Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, and Donna Muhammad were the authors of this article, all right? And the focus of the story was on the 45th annual convention of the um, SCLC, which is the Southern Christian Leadership Convention, held early, um, earlier um, that month in August in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, where King was assassinated at. Now, Before that, 
on April the eighth, nineteen eighty nineteen ninety eight. I think it was it was um Coretta Scott, um, Dexter King. Um, of course, you know, that is um Coretta Scott King, um, Martin Luther King's wife and her, and their son, Dexter King, um, former governor govern um congressman, excuse me, um, uh, Reverend Walter um Fontroy and former United Nations ambassador, also former mayor of, of Atlanta, Georgia, um, Andrew Young, met with the um US Attorney General Janet Reno for nearly three hours. All right, and they demanded a new federal investigation into the King's assassination. This is how all of this got kicked off, based on the evidence that had come to their attention. And the family alleged that Reverend Jesse Jackson and Samuel Billy Cow were involved in the assassination of Dr. King. Now, in an April 4th, 1997, Atlanta Constitutional um, Constitution article. Um, said that Fontroy believed, now this is what the Fontroy, former um, congressman, he stated that Ray did not fire the shot that killed King and was part of a larger conspiracy that possibly involved federal law enforcement agencies. And he added, all right, and was added was that Fontroy said that he kept silent about his suspicion because of the fear for himself and his family. Now, Fontroy stated that when he left Congress in 1991, he had the opportunity to read raw material that has never been seen before in the King assassination. Among that um, information, um, he learned that in three weeks before King's murder, the FBI chief, Jango Hoover, held a series of meetings with persons involved with the CIA and military intelligence in the Phoenix operation in Southeast Asia. Fontroy asked why and discovered that there have been Green Berets and military intelligent agents in Memphis when King was killed. And he asked the question, what, what were they there doing? All right, so we're going to get into that tonight. Um, matter of fact, um, Philip um, Millicent, the author of the Merkin Conspiracy, he asked uh, Memphis Police Department Inspector Sam Evans, um, commander of the units, why they was pulled back the morning on April 4th, in effect making a, an assassin, I guess, the escape easier. And Evans said that he was given the orders at the request of the local pastor connected with King's party, Reverend Samuel Cowles. Right, you hear Cow's name come up a lot as we break this information down. And William Pepper's book, um, Order to Kill, said that Billy Cow was a Memphis police informant. Sam Evans, the Memphis police inspector who we just talked about, confirms that Billy Cow was one of the informants. All right. However, in Gerald Poshner, in his book, The Killing the Dream, he stated that Reverend Billy Cowles was not an FBI informant, but William Pepper never stated that Cowles was an FBI informant, but a Memphis police informant, and that was verified by Samuel Evans, all right, who was the um, MPD inspector at that time period, all right? Now, um, Jim Callum. All right, who had worked for the um, MP, um, the um, Intelligence Bureau, confirmed that on December 20th, 1994, that he had learned that Reverend Billy Cowell had been an informant during the years of 1967 through 1968. All right, now this information was revealed, you know, but we're going to get into it, and we're going to get to that in a second here. Now, the final quote of print, an article that stated, um, that Jesse Jackson and Billy Cowles were involved in the assassination, but on the day that King was assassinated, a dinner was scheduled to take place at the home of Billy Cowles at 5 p.m. Now, he's supposed to be meeting with the invaders. Now, the invaders were a group in which they patterned themselves after um, the Black Panther Party, all right? 
Now, for years, Kyle had claimed that he had been in Dr. King's room during the last hour of Dr. King's life. He lied. Jose Williams stated that this was false and that during most of the afternoon until minutes right before Dr. King was assassinated, SCLC had a um, executive staff meeting. And since Kyle was not a member of SCLC, he wasn't at the meeting. All right, so it says that, um, as a matter of fact, Ralph Abernathy, Reverend Ralph Abernathy goes further and says that um, about Kyle's story. And matter of fact, Ralph was angry about it. And it says that if Billy Kyle said that, then Billy Kyle is a liar. And now Ralph said that Kyle had at no time been in the room with them. But Kyle did knock on the door of, um, of King and Abernathy's around the time of 5.51 p.m. Ten minutes right before the assassination at 6.01 p.m. And Kyle exchanged a few words with Dr. King, obviously about Dr. King wearing that tie. And it was alleged that it was Kyle who made sure that King had on his tie. And Steve Coakley breaks that information down. All right? Now, for those who don't know who Steve Coakley is, um, Lace Salon, he passed on this past year. Um, matter of fact, um, I spoke with him about a week and a half prior to his death, and um, I was trying to get him on the radio show. That never transpired. But... This is why we're dedicating this information to him um, tonight, you know, in order to get this out and, um, you know, come across as plainly as we possibly can about who was involved and who was these black devils involved in the death of Martin Luther King, all right? So it was alleged that it was Kyle who made sure that King had on his tie, all right? Nevertheless, Dr. King then closed the door and Kyle proceeded um, some distant north of the balcony, Right now, during the cross-examination of Billy Cowell and the um, King's family um, legal um, team, they played a video news conference dated April the 3rd, 1998. Now, during this news conference, Cowell said, now y'all can go and see this, it's on YouTube. He was here, and I was there talking about Martin Luther King. And only when I moved away so that they would have a clear shot, then the shot rung out. Now, hold up. Who's the day? To some, this was a Freudian slip, along with other information that had caused some people to believe that Kyle was involved in the murder, and he was. There's no doubt about it. It was Billy Kyle who um, told the Memphis police that King did not need protection that day. April 4th, 1968. And that King would have his tie on. All right? Now, before Dr. King came off, um, came on to the balcony, J.C. Jackson had a um, conversation with Chauncey um, Esridge in regards to Jesse not having on the tie. And Jesse Jackson replied, Doc, talking about King, the, re- um, the requisites for eating supper is an appetite, not a tie. So Jesse was wearing um, brown trousers, and a matching turtleneck, all right, the same turtleneck in which that he wore for three days with the blood smeared all over it from Martin Luther King. And we'll get to that in a minute. But he insisted that he did not need a tie, all right? So obviously between, um, obviously both of them, Kyle and Jackson, were at the 4.30 um, p.m. briefing from the 101 um, or the 111, excuse me, military intelligence group, all right? And that the 20th Special Forces Group that had an eight-man sniper team at the assassination location on that day were instructed that the friendlies would not be wearing ties. And friendlies meant FBI informants or agents. Friendlies were not to be killed. So now we know who they were that Billy Cowell was referring to. We're going to get deeper. We're going to get we're going to do name to names. All right, so with the rest of the SCLC off at the hospital, Jesse became the media spokesman. And y'all can also see that on YouTube, too. All right, so it says that um, this is what Jesse was saying, that the, oh, that the black people leader, our Moses, the once in oh, 400 or 500 years of leader, had been taken from us by hatred and bitterness, 
even as I stand at this hour, I, I cannot even allow hate to enter my heart at this time. For it was sickness, not meanness, that killed them. And then he goes on to say, people were, some were in pandemonium, some were in shock, some were crying, hollering, oh God. And I immediately started running upstairs to where he was. And I caught his head. And I tried to feel his head. And I asked him, I said, Dr. King, do you hear me? Dr. King, do you hear me? And he didn't say anything. And I tried to hold his head. Now, this is what Jesse said. Now, of course, he was lying and trying to benefit off of the King Legacy. And, matter of fact, benefited so well till he became um, the head man after the death of Martin Luther King. And, matter of fact, Andrew Young, um, as well as Hosea Williams, have both gone on record that Jesse Jackson dipped his hands in Martin Luther King's blood and smeared it onto his sweat or shirt, as we would say. And, matter of fact, um, Andrew Young's... Um, who actually was, you know, the SCLC um, executive um, director, went on to become a United States congressman, a United States ambassador of the United Nations, and mayor of Atlanta, all right? Um, as we would see, he benefited um, um, greatly, you know, in that regard, too. But what Andrew Young says, that the blood, the curling, were all things I read in the newspaper, and they were all mysteries to me. So... The blood and the cradling were all things he read in the newspaper, and he said that they was mysteries to him. So he didn't know anything, you know, um, you know, the blood and the cradling. He said basically the cradling thing didn't happen. That's basically what he was essentially saying. Now, King chosen successor um, as leader of the SCLC, of course, was Reverend Ralph Abernathy. And Ralph Abernathy went on and says that Reverend Jesse Jackson would not um, say to me that he cradled Dr. King. I'm sure that Reverend Jackson would realize that I was the person who was on the balcony with Dr. King, and he did not leave, and I did not leave his side until he um, until he was pronounced dead at St. Joseph Hospital in Memphis. I am sure that he would not say to me that he even came near Dr. King after Doc was shot. All right, so um, as a matter of fact, um. Not only is that the truth of the matter, it was actually Ralph Abernathy who actually held um, King, but someone did get close, and the first person um, out on the balcony, um, as you see on that famous picture of everyone pointing, you see Meryl McCullen over top of Dr. King, who's laying on the ground. You would see Andrew Young. Um, you would see Jesse Jackson, and you would see... Um, the brother who called in last week, um, he said that that's is his mother. But they was all pointing to where McCullen um, stated that the shot came from. But the shots actually came from the grassy knoll, or as we would say, the bushes. All right, so um, you know, a matter of fact, James Bevel he said this was um, he said. Um, who was responsible for bringing Jesse Jackson to the organization, had these words to say about Jesse's bloody shirt lie. Among the journalists who would later avail themselves of of, um, of Bevel, this is what, this, so Bevel actually um, speak about um, Jesse, um, this, this particular um, shirt. This is what he says. He says, Jesse was... Um, like the to a prostitute and to lie about the crucifixion of a prophet within a race for the sake of one's own self grand um, grand grandizement was the most gruesome crime a man can commit. This is actually what um James Bevel um spoke about that um self um grand um, grandizement. Um, is what Jesse Jackson benefited from. As a matter of fact, according to Isaiah Williams, Jesse Jackson um, told him on the night of the assassination that he was ill and he was going to Chicago to get medication. The next morning, Hosea and others saw Jesse Jackson on the NBC Today show promoting himself with the bloody stained shirt that supposedly came from Jesse holding Dr. King. 
Now, mainstream media outlets such as Playboy, Time Magazine, published articles promoting Jesse's bloody shirt lie and called him the heir apparent to Dr. King. According to Barbara um, Reynolds, at least 100 articles promoted Jesse and his bloody shirt lie. Matter of fact, 104. And and attendance at Jesse's Operation Breadbasket memorial service increased from 400 um, the Saturday before King's assassination to 4,000 Saturday after Dr. King's assassination. And reporter Betty Washington noticed that Jesse tried to sound like Dr. King during the speech. Now, King was allegedly shot with a 30 odd 6 and was in the room 306. Right, so that was that Masonic shit. <clears throat> because we know that Martin Luther King was a Mason, and we know that um, um, that um, Diego Hoover was a Masonic Shriner. All right. However, according to the article, um, CNN, the James Earl rifle, um, James Earl Ray's rifle did not fire the bullet that killed Martin Luther King Jr. It was in an article, um, dated. July eleventh, nineteen ninety seven. Now, who was over that? Who was over the bullets? Well, check this out. It was amazing because Judge Joe Brown and Judge Joe Brown said that um, that the bullets resembled a handgun. All right. Steve Coker stated that there was at least two gunshots in Martin's own face. All right. Allegedly from three slugs, and hence the um, the question arises: What was J- um, Jesse Jackson pulling out the tote bag when um, Ernestine Campbell saw him? Now that's something else that we're gonna get into, All right? But Joe Brown said that basically is that um, over the two years of the hearing on the rifle, testified that 67 percent of the bullets from his test did not match um, Ray's rifle, and he added that the unfired bullet found wrapped up in the blanket were different from the bullet taken from King's body and therefore was different from a lot of ammunition. Okay? He, this is what he said. He said, Brown said that this weapon literally could not have been, could not have hit the um, broad side of a barn. This is what he said about that, um, um, about that 30 odd 6 on um, Remington 7, um, 60, um, game master rifle. He said, in his opinion, that this is not the murder weapon. This is what Joe Brown said. Now you can see Joe, Judge Joe Brown every day on TV. All right, so y'all take that shit up with him. Now, there was a witness named Betsy Brewer, the owner of the boarding house, could not identify the individual and refused to identify Ray as the man she had rented the room to. The other witness, Stephen um, Stevens, common law wife Grace, says she did get a good look at him and that it was definitely not James Earl Ray. Now, Grace's drunken husband be- um, became the referred witness, and Grace was committed to a mental institution. And according to her lawyer, C.M. Murphy, she was committed, committed illegally, and after she was committed, the Memphis prosecutor, um, prosecutors removed her records from the hospital. And after years of imprisonment under heavy um, sedation, Grace still refused to recant her story. And in um, addition to Brewer, two other witnesses at the border house insist that the man who rented Ray's room looked nothing like James or Ray. This is where the character of Raul comes in at. Now, Olivia Catlin saw a man in a checkered shirt come running out of the alley beside the building across from the Lorraine Motel. The man jumped into a green 1965 Chevrolet just as the police drove up behind him. Catlin said, I will go into my grave saying that this was not Ray because the gentleman I saw was heavier than Ray. Catlin also testified um, that from her vantage point of the um, corner of Millbury and Hullen, she could see a fireman standing alone across the motel when the police drove up. She heard him say to the police the shot came from the clumps of bushes, indicating the heavy, overgrown, bushy area facing the um, Lorraine Motel and adjacent to Fire um, Station 2. Now, 
Earl Codwell was in New York Times, um, a New York Times reporter, um, was in his room at the Lorraine Hotel at the time on the evening of um, April the 4th, and he said that he saw a man crouching in heavy part, um, um, heavy part of the bushes across the street. All right? In a 1993 affidavit from former SCLC official James Orange um, that was read in the record, Orange said that on April the 4th he noticed quite early that next morning, around 8 or 9 o'clock, that all the bushes and bushes on the hill was cut down and cleared up. It was as though the entire area of bushes from behind the Roman house had been cleared. The document, um, FBI document dated April the 13th, 1968, said that after King was shot, all right, when Solomon Jones, who was um, King's chauffeur in Memphis and also a, um, a um, allegedly a allegedly to um, what has been said that he was also a Memphis police um, informant, looked around Mulberry Street into the heavy, bushy area, and he got a quick glimpse of a person with his back towards Mulberry, and this person was running rather fast, and he recalls that he believed he was wearing some sort of light-colored jacket with some sort of a hood or parka. Now, Maynard um, Stills, who in 1968 was a senior officer in the um, Memphis Sanitary Department or Sanitation Department, confirmed in his testimony that the bushes near the Roman House was cut down. At around 7 a.m. on April the 5th, Stills told the jury he received a call from the um, Memphis Police Department Inspector Sam Evans. All right, now we already mentioned him requesting the assistance in clearing bushes and debris from a vacant lot in the vicinity of the assassination. And Stills um, identified the site as an over um, as an area of overgrown um, um, bush and brush across from the Lorraine Hotel. Now, so this is where this shooting was carried out at, all right? Now, from um, for King, April the 3rd, 1968, arrival, However, when it was for the same reason I asked um, to form the special black um, bodyguard. Matter of fact, Williams was the um, was the one who was supposed to be his bodyguard, but they did not. They they removed him. As a matter of fact, all right. If you get um, information, you'll find out more about him. And um, Leon Cohen, a retired New York. Um, police officer testified that in 1968 he had become friendly with the Lorraine Motel owners, um, Walter Bailey. And on the morning after King's murder, Cohen spoke with a visible upset Bailey outside his office at the Lorraine. And Bailey told Cohen about a strange request that has been forced him to change King's room to the location where he was shot. Bailey explained that the night before King arrived, he had uh, received a call from a member of King's group in Atlanta, all right, the caller whom Bailey said he knew but referred to on, but referred to him only by um, he, wanted the motel, wanted the motel owner to change King's room, and Bailey said he was animately opposed to moving King as instructed from a inner courtroom behind the um, motel office to an outside balcony room exposed to public view, right? Now, this is the thing. Six days before the King's assassination, the FBI was applying pressure to move him from the um, hotel in Rivermont, where he stayed, you know, on his last two Memphis visits to the fine Hotel Lorraine, where he was killed. Now, King co-worker Jose Williams testified in the 1993 HBO television trial of um, James Earl Ray, that when he arrived in um, with Dr. King on April the 3rd, they were looking forward to staying at the Rivermont Holiday Inn, and that he was surprised that when um, when they was taken to the Lorraine Hotel, um, Motel, he said that neither he nor anyone else in the entourage was familiar with the Lorraine, and no one understood why the change was made. All right. So now Williams also goes on um, that in 
that Dr. King was initially given a room on the ground floor, but for some reason the room was changed. Now, that ground floor room was room 202. Now, when Lorraine Bailey, who was the name, who the hotel was named after, um, Walter Bailey was her husband, learned on April the 4th that Dr. King had just been shot on the balcony, she groaned, oh, my God, and she suffered a stroke. And she never regained consciousness and died five days later at the same hotel, I mean, at the same hospital where King was taken, St. Joseph Hospital. All right, so... um. Who changed these rooms? Guess it was Reverend Billy Cow. Changed the room from 202 to 306. And the owner of the Lorraine Motel, Walter Williams, um, Walter, excuse me, Walter um, Bailey, um, confirmed that. All right, so you can see this is the way in which that all this was working. Now, something else interesting that with these hotel rooms is that within room 315, 316, and is a question mark on the room 318, this is where the invaders were staying at. Once again, they was patting themselves after um, the Black Panthers, all right? And they was heavily armed. And this is the reason why um, they wanted them from out the hotel at the time because they actually was there in order to protect Dr. King. All right? Now, who went to go check on these rooms? It was Jesse Jackson. On the night of um, April the 1st, 1968, the invaders had a meeting with Hosea Williams, James Bevel, Jesse Jackson, and James Orange to help their participation in the planning of the march with the invaders, um, 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 with the march. And the invaders moved into room 315 and 316 located south of Dr. King's room on April the 3rd, 1968, all right, at the Lorraine um, Motel, all right. So since the invaders were short on money, the SELC had agreed to pick up some of the, um, you know, invaders' motel bill. Less than 30 minutes before Dr. King was assassinated, a strange event took place with the invader, Charles Izzy um, Harrington, who was one of the invaders, um, occupying room 315 and 316, um, further along with the balcony from um, Dr. King's room 306, um, Izzy said that around 545 or 550, all right, now remember, towels go to Dr. King's room at 551. Someone else goes to Izzy in the rooms, the invaders' rooms, around 545 or 550, all right? And so it says a maid knocked on his door and told him that the invaders was going to have to leave the motel because Dr. King's group was no longer going to pay their bill, right? Now, when Izzy asked who had given her those instructions, she said Reverend Jesse Jackson. So Jesse Jackson um, is the one who did that, and also he went by and checked the rooms himself in order to make sure Now this is this is the plot. This this is what this this is what is going on. All right. So, um, um, Izzy, um, you know, and the rest of the invaders gather up their things and left. Um, some in um Charles Cabbage blue must uh, Mustang, others on foot. This explained the sudden departure, uh, recorded in, um in the log in which that they um, brought up in the case. Now, when we get more into this, you, you'll find that Merrill McCullen was part of the group of the invaders. He invaded their group, all right? He was a um, Memphis Police Department agent working as a mole. You know what I'm saying? In the invaders group, who goes on to become a CIA agent? Okay. Now Jesse Jackson is one of the um of the Memphis police informants also, but prior to this, Jesse was groomed by the FBI 
as an informant since his days at A&T in Greensboro, North Carolina. All right? Jesse Jackson also bought Ernest Withers, another FBI informant who was with the um, civil rights, who was a civil rights um, photographer, into um, Dr. King's camp. All right? So there was a lot of informants, informants around Dr. King. All right? Now, um, matter of fact, there was a, I guess you would say, a United States um, Justice Department official, according to Marcus um, 3X, he says um, that this United States Justice Department official um, said that he had questions about Reverend Jesse Jackson and that um, he examined Jesse Jackson's secret file locked up in the, um, in, in the office. And he said he shouldn't be talking about this, but he leaned over and spoke in a very low voice. It was a stack of papers several feet high. And he added, impatient, I asked, so what, oh, this is what Marcus said, he said, so what did it show? He confirmed that what I found out from other sources over the years, that Jesse had been an FBI informant most of his adult life. So he's a government freak. And so, um, and so the guy goes on to tell him the U.S. Um, Department of Justice um, tells Marcus that my boss knew, I knew it, and he said, um, as he cuts off the discussion, so you know, he cuts off that, that discussion. And he said, absolutely. So that has been verified. Um, but it goes on to say, subcommittee of the assassination devolved into the murder of um, President Kennedy and Dr. King, and that the staff member. Um, basically, I guess you can say speaks about the fact that Jesse Jackson was handpicked to replace Dr. King before King's assassination by the FBI. All right, and that Dr. King opposed the Vietnam War and was a threat to um, interfere for um, interfere with U.S. Uh, foreign policies, and that's what happened. All right, and so um, this goes on in order to expose um, messy, J- um, messy Jesse, um, as Dr. Collie referred to him as. All right, so Martin Luther King first became a target of the FBI following the riots of um, Albany, Georgia, when the um, when the New York Times ran an um, article critical of the overt racism that the FBI was demonstrating, and King went on record as agreeing with that assessment. All right, that's when it got hot. But King, truthfully, was already being monitored at the age of um, 15. All right, when he graduated high school at the age of 15, he was already being, um, and graduated college at the age of 19, so he was already being monitored by the FBI, actually. All right. Um, if you go get the COINTEL, um, COINTEL Pro, or what is known as the Counterintelligence Program, Black Nationalist Hate Group, um, Racial Intelligence, is dated a month right before Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. It was on March the 4th, 1968. It says for maximum effectiveness of the COINTELLIGENCE Program and to prevent waste effort, wasted efforts. Um, it says um, long-range goals are being set prevent the coalition of militant black nationalist groups in unity there is strength a choice that is less valid for all that is um treasonous um triteness and it says as evidence you know, right, or as effective excuse me coalition by black national groups may be the first step towards a real mile mile which is of course a black revolutionary army or from out of Kenya but in America and it says that the beginning of a true black revolution prevent the rise of a black messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movements. And it says that Malcolm might have been such a messiah. He is the mortar of today, of the movement today. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, which of course is Carmen Ture, and Elijah Muhammad all expired to this position. Elijah Muhammad is less of a threat because of his age. King could be a very real contender for this position, should be um, abandoned 
his supposed obedience to whites, liberal doctrine, nonviolence, and embrace black nationalism. All right, and then of course, um, Carmichael, so the Carmichael, which is Kwame Ture, had the necessary charisma to be a real threat in this way. All right, and of course, you know, we know that he had to end up, you know, going to our. All right, and um, you know, so this, you know, it states within this particular document. Of course, you can read this, um, but it goes on further to say that these target members and the followers of the um, Student Nationalist Coordination um, Committee, um, which is called SNCC, um, of course, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference (SCLC). Revolutionary Arm um, um, Action Movement, RAM, Nation of Islam, um, and of course emphasis was added. Officers handling these cases and those of Stokely Carmichael's of SNCC, um, H. Um, Rat Brown of of, um, of SNCC, Martin Luther King of SCLC, Maxwell Stanford of um, of RAM, and Elijah Muhammad of of um of the um, Nation of Islam, should be alerted for the co- um, counterintelligence suggestions, J. Edgar Hoover. Now, you can get this information from Brian Click from his book, The War at Home, The Covert Action Against the United States Activists and What We Can Do About It. Right, that is definitely a book in which that we all need to be reading. Um, you know, now, now we're going over on with Jesse, but of course, we know um, Jesse basically is an extorter. He shaked down various businesses, you know, um, and that's how he gets his money. Um, he's been doing that um, since the 70s, all right, since after the death of Martin Luther King, all right, um, as he's been put in that position. You know, how is it possible for um, for a man who has never actually held position in a church, you know, as reverend, you know, um, you know, never had a church, um, the organizations, you know, which that he's part of or that he's supposedly informed, never have gone um, into other major cities or, be, or became national, all right, only within um, basically in Chicago area, but yet he's a millionaire, multimillionaire, all right? There's some things in which that we had to ask about that question, you know, and asked about um, how did that happen, you know, never held the job, you know, um, in his day, you know, so good questions. Now, this is what Steve Coakley says about it. He said, further into the article, you'll find a section in which that um, Steve Coakley speaks about that 15 minutes before the assassination, a community group that was there to protect Dr. King was removed um, specifically at the request of Jesse Jackson. So he verifies that once again. Now, when we get more into this article um, and different other information, because this is actually um, much, much research, which that we put together here, I'm dealing with this. All right, so we know about Jesse. Um, as a fact, um, Jesse would not have been the top candidate or the heir apparent. He actually would have been um, six if that was the case. Um, Ralph Abernathy would have been first, Andrew Young, Hosea Williams, James Bevel, James Orange, and then Jesse if that was the case, all right, um, for leadership and what is called um, the SCLC. Right. Um, we go into that on that night, um, April the 3rd, 1968, Floyd Newsom, I'm a black firefighter and civil rights activist heard that King I've been to the mountaintop speech um, at the Mason Temple in uh, Memphis um, that night. And on his return home, Newsom returned a phone, had a phone call from his lieutenant who told him that he was temporarily transferred, effective April the 4th, from, fi- um, from Fire Station 2, which is right across the street from the Lorraine Hotel, to Fire Station 31. And Newsom testified that he was needed at the um, new station, right? That's what happened. He said he was not needed at the um, at the um, at that station. That he needed to be at the um, um at the other station. So that is what you know took place. There was another black firefighter um, um, at fire station two, Novell um, Wallace, 
who testified that he received orders to be temporarily transferred um, to a fire um, station far removed from Lorraine Hotel. He was later told vaguely that he had been threatened, right? And then in um, March, um, April probe, um, I think his name was um, Mike Venice, described the similar removal of Ed Reddits, a black Memphis police department detective from Fire Station 2 who did surveillance two hours before King's murder. And um, to um, understand that Reddick's um, incident, it was important to note that it was Reddick himself who initiated his watch on Dr. King from the um, fire um, house across the street. And Reddick testified that when King party um, and, the, and the police um, accommodating them, arrived from the airport at the Lorraine Hotel on April the 3rd, he noticed something that was very unusual. When Inspector Don Smith, who was in charge of the security, told Riddick he could leave, and Riddick noticed that um, there was nobody else there. And in the past, when um, they was assigned to Dr. King, you know, they would stay with him, you know, and he saw nobody was with him. So um, he said he went down the street and asked the fire department, um, could we come um, come in um, and reserve from the red? And it says that um, because of um, giving, you know, really concern from um, for King's safety. You know, that's what that was all about, you know, allegedly. Um, you know, that's what he um, said. And according to um, um, Officer Eli Arkins, um, who was there at the fire um, station too, um took him to central um, headquarters. There, the police and the fire um, di- um, director, Frank Hollisman, former F- former FBI agent for 25 years, seven of them were supervised um, under Jagger Uber's um, office, um, ordered Riddick home. All right? So this is how Riddick ended up not being there, even though he had concerns about Martin Luther King and his safety. All right. Matter of fact, um, the former um, Memphis captain Jerry um, Williams followed Riddick from the um, witness stand and goes on to say that he was responsible for forming a special security unit of black officers whenever King came to Memphis, and that's the um, team in which that Riddick served on. All right, and uh, Williams goes on to say that he took pride in providing the best possible protection for Dr. King. But remember, they was told by King's party, so when King's party, not to um, have that protection that they did, he would not need it. All right? And that came from the informant, Billy Cowles. All right, now, um, in Memphis, there was an um, Alpha 184 team leader um, introduced Warren and Mur- Murphy to Lieutenant um, Eli Hawkins of the um, Memphis Police Intelligence Bureau. And Hawkins reported them that um, their sister was essential to save the city, that King's, Dr. King's forces were preparing to burn down. That's basically what that was stated. Um, they then met up with the um, contact around 1 p.m., and Warren named him and said he believed he was a CIA agent. Um, they was um, taken to their perch on top of the Illinois Central Railroad building where they was assumed a state of readiness. In the course of the afternoon, the team leader put Warren on the radio with um, Memphis Police Inspector Sam Evans, who described the layout of the um, Lorraine, and he also advised them that the friendlies would not be wearing ties. The only government agent um, we have identified who was physically close to Dr. King at the time of the killing was Merrill McCullens, who was also not wearing a tie. All right, It was also known that Merrill, um, uh, Merrill McCullens was one of the first to reach King's fallen body. All right? And he's the one who um, basically told everyone to point you know, towards um, the top of the building away from the bushes. All right? But we know that he was an undercover agent for the Memphis Police Department. All right. Matter of fact, this is verified by Doctor um, by Mark Lane, 
uh, writer Mark Lane, as well as also Dick Gregory. As a matter of fact, um, it was um, codenamed Zorro, the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. in a book from 1977. All right? Um, it's also to note, interesting, that James Earl Ray was wearing a tie, although Raul, um, um, Raul who they always like to make mention of, um, allegedly was not. All right, um, and of course Raul, um, the son was Frank Sturgis, or either Jewel, um, Ron Kimball. All right, and um, based on reports, um, we know that Kimball was definitely in cahoots with um, the CIA, as he reports himself. You know, but. Frank Sturgis is actually Raul, but um, we know that Kimball was definitely there on the scene, too. There was two men in which that James Earl Ray speaks about, in which that he met, or that um, was there around that time period. I mean, immediately after Dr. King came up onto the balcony, Jesse Jackson cried out, um, our leader. And from Jesse's crying out, froze Dr. King on the balcony you know, as possibly to use as a signal to let the assassins know that the target is in position to be shot. Not long after Jesse cried out, Dr. King, um, someone fired at least one shot that killed Dr. King. The first person to reach Dr. King um, was Ralph Abernathy, but the other one was Meryl McCullen, who was over the body in that famous picture. Ralph noticed Billy Cow crying like a baby and told him to call for an ambulance. Kyle tried to use the phone, but he couldn't get in contact because, like we said, um, Lorraine Bailey, um, who was the, um, you know, over the um, switchboard, she suffered a stroke or, you know, a heart attack. You know, you know, some say it was a stroke, some say it was a heart attack. You know, and as you can see, um, certain key people in the position could have been um, there possibly to prevent Dr. King from being killed was either told to leave the rain um, the rain motel or you know what I'm saying? They was they was told to leave. You no, know, and so in um William Pepper's book, Orders to Kill, we're gonna bring this issue back up about Jesse Jackson. Um Ernest Campbell along with her husband, who owned a trumpet hotel located by the um Lorraine Hotel, moments before and after Dr. King was shot, she made the following observation. Um her attention was in a particular drawing, particularly drawn to Jesse Jackson, who she said um, had one foot on the first step of the stairway, looking up to the balcony, while bent over putting something in a suit bag. And Jesse Jackson looked startled when Ernestine Campbell noticed him putting something in a suit bag. What item could Jesse possibly be placing in the suit bag? Now, remember we said earlier that. Um, that according to Judge Joe Brown, that it looked like a handgun was used, and that there was two holes, three slugs. All right. Now, my man Steve Copley, <laughs> he goes in on that, and so what was the suit bag notice? You know, what was this suit bag noticed by Ernestine? Was this the same tote bag Don Ross, um, or Rose, excuse me, Don Rose um, noticed Jesse carrying around Chicago shortly after Dr. King's assassination? Okay? Now, Jesse Jackson was the first person to call Dr. King's wife to let um, her know about her husband being shot. By him being the first person to call Dr. King's wife, he would make himself appear innocent in the eyes of many, especially Dr. King's family. Now, however, Charles Cabbage, who was one of the invaders, said that he observed Reverend Jesse Jackson standing on the um, ground near the swimming pool, which was opposite the balcony room occupied by Dr. King and the invaders. He said that um, Reverend Jackson kept glancing impatiently at his watch. Now, in all fairness, they were supposed to... Um, um, the invaders were supposed to meet um, at Reverend Kyle's home at 5 p.m. But anyway, it says that night in Memphis, after King's body has been taken away, um, you know, of course we know um, that Jesse 
um, ended up getting on the cameras and speaking, as we said earlier, all right? Um, as a matter of fact, um, it goes into this information. As a matter of fact, um, Steve Coakley said that um, that he had a cable show in, in Chicago back in the days where he exposed Jesse Rose in the King's assassination and that Jesse lived in Chicago and that he saw the show. Um, Steve Coakley stated that he was inspired by Al Sharpton's book, Go Tell It on the Mountain, where Sharpton stated, paraphrasing, Jesse Jackson was my preacher, uh, was my teacher, excuse me, and Ralph Abernathy was jealous of Jesse, and it pissed me off. Right now, Steve talked about it on his cable TV show, and Steve brought it up, and Jesse called Al, telling him what Steve um, Coakley said. Now, all right, and now the amazing thing that even Steve Coakley, um, that even, um, excuse me, that even Jesse Jackson Jr. has stated to Steve that his father, Jesse Jackson Sr., will have to answer to these allegations, all right? Now, we see um, Jesse Jackson Jr. also now with his own allegations, all right, and him having to leave being a, um, a member of um, Congress, now, according to Ron Howell, activists said that without a doubt, Reverend Al Sharpton was also an FBI informant who tried to set up the recapture, um, what we call the, I guess, the um, FBI wanted escapee fugitive Osada Shakur, all right, in 1983. So, you know, so it's informant after informant. All right. Nevertheless, it appears that Al Sharpton got in contact with um, Wyatt T. Walker, the SELC field director, and tells Al protect and um and tells Al to protect Coakley. And um, Wyatt further states that asks Jesse, how did he get out of Memphis on that night when the planes, buses, trains, and cars, etc., all modes of transportation were shut down? All right. And um, Dick Gregory told Steve Coakley that the FBI called the airport on that night asking Jesse to get out of town telling others um, those part of King's entourage that of course he was sick as we made mention of earlier but Jesse of course we know he headed back to um, to um, the next morning on Rockefeller's own NBC um, Good Morning America and um, he gets on there with his shirt and tell him that lie that he cradled Dr. King in his arms but the crazy thing is that um, Jesse Jackson's wife, Jacqueline, said that he got in bed with that same bloody-ass shirt on that night. And other reports that he wore that shirt for at least three days afterwards. All right? Now, we know who Jagger Hoover is, all right, or Gagger Hoover, Mr. Transvestite himself. And he started with a vicious rumor campaign against Martin Luther King. All right, and he was hiding the fact that he himself had African, um, you know, so-called African blood or Moorish blood. All right, uh, matter of fact, um, he um, he had that descent on his father's side from the Mississippi Hoovers, and that he was very ashamed of his ancestry, post-traumatic slave disorder. All right, it was also indicated that Hoover was gay, was a cross-dresser, an extremely sick individual, um, in the head individual. Very sinister in the way he would go about targeting people and setting them up. Now, this is from the book, um, Official and Confidential Secret Life of Jagger Hoover by Anthony Summers. All right? And so we know that, um, you know, um, this dude was sick. And that's the reason why he never um, had kicks and he had to turn to homosexuality is because um, his children would possibly come out melanated. And so he did not want this to happen. All right. Now, regardless, Diego Hooper enlisted the mafia godfather, Carlos Marcellos. You know, gave him a million dollars to do king. But the mafia was smart. They wouldn't use the Italians to do the murder for the feds. Matter of fact, in um, Double Cross by um, Sam um, Garcinia and Chuck Garcinia, Sam Garcinia states that we helped out Hoover many times cooling down that nigga Sean um, King. 
All right? That's what he said. It's in the book. So the mafia paid local police as hitmen for the federal target. All right? And we're going to get into who that actually was in a second. Matter of fact, um, Myron um, Billet was able to reveal that in um, January of 1968 that FBI and CIA agents office, um, offered um, Marcellos or the New York Mafia leader a million-dollar contract to kill Martin Luther King. And uh, Myron Billet was a messenger or go between the Chicago um, Mafia Don Sam Garcia. And in, ni- in January 1968, Garcia asked Billet to make the arrangements for a very important meeting between New York Mafia leader um, Carlos Gambino and some um, government representative and Billy set up the meeting at the hotel in the Appalachian, New York, in the site of a 19 early mob summit. And it says that Billy said that at the meeting where he attended, the three representatives of the CIA and FBI asked Carlos um, Gambini if he would accept a million dollar contract to assassinate Martin Luther King. And Billy um, recalled the exact words that Gambino applied. In no way would I or the family get involved um, um, with you people again. You messed up the Cuba deal. You messed up the Kennedy deal. All right? And the CIA men said that they would make other arrangements and depart it. Now, so we go into how they made other arrangements with other family members, as we said earlier, um, or just previously here. So this is all verified. All right? So we got the mob. We got um, the Black Devils, you know, Jesse Jackson, Billy Cow. Other informants, um, whether they was Memphis or whether they was um, FBI or CIA, um, we also have um, um, the military involvement. This was a serious conspiracy here. All right, and it says that after Dr. King's was assassinated on April the fourth, Sam Garcia um, gave um, Myron Billick thirty thousand dollars and told him to um, start running. They both knew too much, and they was going to be, and they was going to be killed. Now, Garcinia was in fact murdered in his Chicago home um, in June 1975, just before he was scheduled to testify before the um, church committee concerning assassination plots. Right, Garcinia, he was shot seven times in a circle around his mouth. In other words, keep your damn mouth closed. But regardless, let's name the names. It was the sharpshooter from the Memphis Police Department, Lieutenant named Earl Clark, all right, who actually did the shooting. He was, um, a matter of fact, Lord Jow, um, it was actually he and Lord Jowls who was the two behind the bushes. If you get the um, January issue of Ebony Magazine, 1986, you will see them hiding behind. You will see them behind the bushes. Yes, you will see that yourself. Of course, now since I done told you, they probably gonna take that shit off the market. But going to get that shit right now. Um, um, all right, is Ebony Magazine, January 1986. Martin Luther King is on the front, and it says the living king. All right, so that's who actually did the killer. All right, that's actually who did the killer. Now, it was a eight-man assault team just in case, though. All right, military assault team or snipers just in case if Clark couldn't do it. They was going to handle it. Um, matter of fact, the testimony of um, writer um, Douglas Valentine filled in for the background of the men, um, Caldwell um, Whedon, um, who was taken up to the um, fire station too. In um, Valentine's book, The Phoenix Program, 1990, he stated that in 1968, the Army 111th Military Intelligence Group kept King under 24-hour surveillance. His agents were in Memphis April the 4th in um, a eight-man United States Army sniper team trained for weeks to use everything from K-bar military Rambo knives to um, anti-tank rockets to terminate Dr. King. They practiced ambushing a moving car in a parking lot. The testimony on which jury um, David Maury 
later described as awesome was that of the former CIA operative Jack um, Terrell, a whistleblower in the Iran-Contra scam. Terrell testified by video that his close friend, J.D. Hill, had confessed to him that he had been a member of the um, Army sniper team in Memphis assigned to shoot an unknown target on April the 4th. Of course, we know who that is. And after training for um, um, training for a triangular shooting, the snipers were on their way into Memphis to take a position in a um, water tower. And two buildings, um, when their mission was suddenly canceled because um, Clark succeeded, all right, and it says Hill said he realized that when he learned of um, King's assassination that the next day that the team must have been part of a contingency plan to kill King if another shooter fell, and who was that shooter once again was Clark. So now Fletcher um, Pouty, or Prouty, was former um, Pentagon colonel and author of The Secret Team, was responsible for providing military support for CIA covert operations in the 1960s. All right, so this is where this um, joint effort came from, naming everyone who was involved in that. Of course, it goes deeper. There's more involved, but we got the main characters. All right? Now, um, we're going to um, go to the phone lines here. I'm going to bring in my co-host. Brother L, you here? Uh, peace, peace, God. All right, peace, God. Hold on a second. We're going to bring in um, caller 561. Caller 561, you're on the line. Hold tap, hold tap, hold tap. You know what it is, peace, Peace, man. Hold tap. Hold tap. Hold tap, bro. Yeah, hold tap. You know, I've been listening to this whole thing. Uh, Doc, you've been going in. You've been going in since day one. You know, and uh, I had a few things to just put out there, you know, how you was mentioning that Dr. King was under surveillance since 15 years old. Right. You know, and what a lot of people got to realize that the same way Hitler had his uh, his move says, you know, guide him through his, his journey, the same way these uh, CIA agents and so forth and so forth have been watching and waiting on uh, Dr. King to come out, you know, from the backdrop. So they already was waiting on him. No doubt. Then, uh, then um, how uh, how you was talking about the, uh, how the, uh, how, uh, what his name is? Um, uh, Jesse Jackson right. had, was like the infiltrator. Right. You know, how else could red ants go into a black ant bed? Right. You know, the red ants never can infiltrate the black ant bed. They always got to use the black ants to get in and infiltrate the, uh, you know, the whole the whole thing. The body. So, I mean, this thing been going on for God knows how long it's been going on. It's just been going on and going on and going on. You know, I actually was looking at the, the whole thing on YouTube, how the um the um the um how the CIA was setting up this whole thing with the the Black Panthers, Dr. King. I mean, this thing been going on for so long that we haven't caught on to their system. They haven't even changed the system. They just improved it. Right. You know? Exactly. I mean, uh, what's going on with us, you know? We need to uh, 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 stop taking the dumb pill and get on some real shit out here because they're going to continue to use the same system over and over and over. Right, because if it's not broke, don't fix it, and that's their motto. So that's what they do. They do the same um, tricks over and over again. You know, exactly. that's, right. That's how right. Dr. Collar was able to um, bypass um, his assass- his um, first assassination attempt back in 1993, 94. Um, I think it was around that time was when um, Jane Edward Best tried to um, do him, you know, and, and right. um, Dr. Collar survived that. You know what I'm saying? Now, he didn't survive the one in, by, you know, 10 years later in 2003, but, um, you know, but he definitely survived that one. 
You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, it, it, we definitely got to um, look at all of this. You know, it, it, it don't makes no it makes no sense at all. You know, it really makes no sense. You know that we keep falling for the same gimmicks. You know, but in that book, it was I was talking about by Brian Click, um, um, War um, at Home. Um, we all need to get that book because there's ways in which that we can definitely um, avoid their technology. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, there should be a textbook on this shit. Right. You know, like how to counteract it. Because, right, and I there mean, is, and that's the book which that we're talking about. We definitely get that book, right. Brian Click, um, War at Home. Um, right. You definitely right. want that. Um, it speaks about the covert war, um, in which that the um, co um, co intel pro waged against, um, you know, these um, black nationalist groups. So you definitely want to get that. They supposed to have to shut down this um, this whole system back in the nineties. Remember that? Right. But someone was saying that why would they shut down a system that works? You know? Right. They just like you saying that you're gonna go and uh, uh, um, sell a car that still drives fine for you. You know, it gets you from point A to point B. You know, the wise man won't sell it. They'll right. Keep it. You know, I, I mean, you, you know, you saying Brian Click? Right, Brian Click. Um, G L R I A N R I A N Click. Um, G L I C K. Oh, G L I C K. Okay, all right. Bro, I appreciate peace, you. Let me go to these other callers. Um, peace, bro. Peace. 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 All right, we got area code seven seven three. Area code seven seven three on the line. Peace. Peace. Seven seven three. Area code seven seven three on the line. All right, we're gonna go to area code three four seven. Area code three four seven. Peace. Peace. Three four seven. You here? Oh, good night, Dr. Bay. Thank you. This is Deborah. Yes. Are you ready for the interview with Dr. Gant? He's on session three. Um, what is what is his number? It's the area code seven seven three. Oh, see, I just called. I just answered for him, and no one answered. Um, hold on, hold on. All right, area code seven five seven. You're on the line. Peace. 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 Yeah, peace to the gods. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I just came in uh, came in kind of late, but um, I heard that you was going in on the King assassination, and um, I was peeping out the show, the last one that you had did on the assassination. I just wanted to add on um, to what you was building on. And basically, um, some info that I had came across was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the guy. You know who um, the chick was in the Black Panthers, Elaine Brown? You heard of her? Yeah, we know Elaine Brown, yeah. Yeah, so in the book she wrote, she talked about the guy, um, the white the white boy in the CIA that she was involved with. Right. Um J. Richard Kennedy or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, I was looking. I looked him up, and what I found was that he was actually a high placed um, contact in King's camp mm-hmm. initially. Right. And so, and when King started to make that uh, transition, more so, uh, you know, to our our side of thinking. You know, started you know talking to, to uh, you know El Malik Shabazz, you know Malcolm. Right, we well, well, to... definitely um got away from the Boule influence. You know, because the Boule right. is nothing more than um, um the buffer or the advisor to the kings between the grassroots movement and the so-called elite or Illuminati. So, uh, you know, yeah. they are the, you know they patted themselves after the Skull and Bone Society, and you can get that information from Charles Wesley's book um, on Sigma Pi Phi, in which that is um. You know, which is the boule, 
you know, and was that they um, definitely um, patted themselves after the Skull and Bones was the second chapter of the Illuminati. So there's no doubt right. about that from off of Yale's campus. So uh, once he moved away from that philosophy, just like W. Boyce moved away from it and became more, um, you know, more of a um, nationalist or more Pan-Africanist in their perspective, you know, this is what happens. Right, yeah, exactly. So when he um, when he started make, making that transition, um, this guy that was um, inside already inside of his camp, um, from what I was reading, he went. He started to report back to the CIA and um, and uh, Hoover that King was becoming communist, and therefore he um, they documented and listed him as a threat to national security. Um, so I'm thinking that this was basically like what they were going to say if they were caught and being implicated um, in setting up his his assassination. They could they they were kind of like basically trying to make a paper trail to say, well, he was about to be communist, um, he was about to be uh, a threat to national security. But basically, yeah. this was like the um, I think the impetus for them starting to plot out his murder um, with this guy, uh, 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 Kennedy, and um, and, uh, and and uh, also Elaine Brown, which I had mentioned earlier, she was actually the reason the um, the Panthers were brought down. Right. And, and you had mentioned, you had talked about uh, Bunchy Carter and Huggins, John right. Huggins' murder on UCLA campus. And what I read was that she actually, um, what she did was she slapped one of the members of the US organization and they ran they back to the right, right. ran back to the room where Bunchy Carter yep. and uh, John Huggins was at, yep. and told told them that they assaulted her. Yep. And then when they confronted the two US organization, um, that's when they were shot. That's and, right. Uh, yeah, mm. yeah. So she she was actually a plant um, into the organization by the CIA. She was mind control, man. Exactly, and, uh, mentoring candidate. Yeah. They all over, right. man. And that's the whole yeah. point of us going back into this in detail. Don't worry, we're gonna get to the Black Panthers. I want you back on for that show, so you make sure you back on. We're gonna get oh, no to doubt. Malcolm X. You know, um, we're gonna go into his next month because that's when he got hurt. It was next, you know, in the month of um, February. Matter of fact, February the twenty first. Um, five days before, um, you know the you know the um, Savior's Day of the Nation Islam. So we're gonna go into that, and um, of course we're gonna get into the Black Panthers probably um, in March. You know what I'm saying? So we're gonna hit them up. You know we're gonna go through the whole assassination of these black devils and their whole roles. You know in um yeah. in particular um cases. Oh boy. Yeah 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 yeah. I, I, I definitely got to be on for the Panthers show. Yes, sir. They, there's a lot of info. That like I don't think you know most of us really really have touched on uh, with the Panthers and, and you know and, and what they were trying to do and what was done to them and yeah it's real deep. It is, it is no doubt about it. So I definitely want you on for that. So um, if you got my number two five two two five seven three five eight eight, give me a call and we can go over some things and um you know we can put it together. Oh yeah, that's what's up. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm get at you, bro. And I appreciate that. Ah uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna be on listening, bro. All right, peace. All right, peace. peace. All right. Um, what we're gonna do right now is gonna go into the second half of the information. Um, we def basically, I guess you can say, we finished up um, the King assassination. Um, if there's any more questions, um, we can stay on. We're gonna go on probably to 11 o'clock tonight. So everybody stay on. Matter of fact, call into the number 626-414-5581 in the chat room that want to continue listening. Call in, 626-414-3535. Once again, that's 626-414-3535. All right? Peace. 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 Peace.
um, from me doing my investigation and research, um, everything is not a coincidence or an accident. Right. Um, dealing with a book that was actually done um, by a brother uh, was actually was speaking about the story of Martin Luther King, about how he was with the American Communist Party at one time. Right. You know, and what most people don't know is before he came affiliated, was put up front to become the front man for the NAACP and the uh, in the civil rights movement. His brother, who was also a minister, he was the one who actually was like the the one that had the power but by Martin Luther King being more educated, more articulate in his speech, then that's when they went head on and went with him. But also at this same time, you know, most people forgot that he was also a part of Alpha Phi Alpha and he was also a part of the uh, Sigma Pi Phi, you know, which was too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So dealing with all these information that you actually bring in up front and up forth, you know, um, I remember I put on Facebook about how the NAACP was actually founded by the Jews. That's you right. See? So yeah. by they had being inside that, you really right. have to ask yourself, where are they getting all these money to finance themselves while this is going on? Right. So this may not have been a coincidence or an accident. This like Brother Stevie Copley had put out there, who I think got assassinated from him putting out the information. Yeah, you know, well, he told me so, a week um, um, before um, a week before he passed, a week and a half before he passed. As a matter of fact, I talked to him a, um, several times, but then um, those two weeks passed, and he told me that, brother, man, they almost got me, brother. He said, when I was in the hospital, they almost got me. Yeah. Wow. He was telling yeah, me that yeah. personally. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so he felt, you know what I'm saying, like they was after him and they was trying to get him. And then no more than a week and a half later, you know what I'm saying, he was gone. Oh, it also, it, it also, what most people don't know is that the speech that Martin Luther King had gave, uh, that I have a dream speech, he did not write that speech. No, it didn't. was some brothers who wrote it because when he spoke, he actually said that the Negro was exiled in his own land. And that was the key right there where most people didn't even must pick it up that we who are this, considered as Negroes was already home in this land. Exactly. And that was a big major key, you see. And well, that, with that, that's funny that that yeah. was the same key in which that Malcolm soon found out when he went to Africa. And, um, you know, he was told that this land was ours too. So right. mm-hmm. that's so so it's funny that they both found out in their last you know, in their last few years of life is that the land went <laughs> to us. <laughs> Maybe they got killed because they're gonna start uh teaching about birthright and national law. A national, you know, nationality and birthright. Well it's possible well, there was three well, chapters left that was left out of the um Alex Haley um autobiography of, of um, Malcolm X and which that is um within um Manning um Marble's book. You know, mm-hmm. which that I suggest everybody get and which that goes into it. But go ahead, Brother um, Paul. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's amazing how the information is coming out when you had Malik El Shabazz get assassinated, Martin Luther King. Well, well, most people don't even know that Martin Luther King wasn't even much his name at that time. You know, um, his name was Michael, but he changed Michael King his name. Jr., that's right. Yeah. Yeah, most people don't even know that. And then you had John F. Kennedy, who actually put his hand inside of the mafia when they started taxing the mafia, and it was like trying to tell his daddy because his daddy was running moonshine and all of this. Hey, tell your boy, exactly. don't don't touch us. You know what I'm saying? And then that's, that's right. when you had the rest of the other Kennedys. Now. The thing is about that John F. Kennedy, he was in the Knights of Columbus. Most right. people don't know that. Right. So it was certain things that had to be done, which was ordered by him by the Roman Catholic Church not to do. You see, it is not a coincidence or an accident. Here you have Joe Biden, who is the vice president of the corporation, who is a Catholic, right? And then, I mean, it's all tied in together. You right. know, it's just like we were speaking about the Black Panthers Party. Also, the Cobra Party, when it was actually, you know, writing letters back and forth, instead of the brothers that are sitting down, they'd be like, hold on, let's who try to coerce against us to fight against one another. But no, 
then he need must do that. So now we must be very uh, vigilant and eye opening to see who are the black devils amongst us. No because uh, there was a letter that came out on a newspaper that was called Newsletter Frontline. They were saying how Jesse Jackson also had things against the Peace Stone. You know what I'm saying? That's so, right. I mean, it's a whole lot of stuff that his hands had bit into. Yeah. You know, so, mm-hmm. and then, you know, he came out there on the land, too, down there in Georgia. And look what happened when that oh, that's guy right. talked about him going to jail. He, right, but so know, he, he was like, shot in too. Yeah, and both of them. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So they both, you see, but they have to use them as a pawn to actually keep the masses of the so-called Miss Norman Negroes asleep to what is actually going on. Yeah. Because yeah. He's, because look, look what wound up happening right when he said about Barack Obama. He said, I like to cut his balls off. Balls but off. here at the NORAC, uh, at the uh, at the speech right. uh, when Barack Obama was at the stadium, he was crying. And I'm like, oh, what the fuck he crying for? He just wanted to cut the balls off. Balls off. Exactly. You know, unless that was a Masonic talk. Right. You see? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Oh, you know, yeah, it is. And then you really got to look at it. You come out with the Rainbow Coalition, and then you have everybody talking about that gay is the new black dealing with civil rights. But you got a Rainbow Coalition, but we know that when they was talking about, oh, man, this man, this is so fucked up, bro. Tain even much funny. That's <laughs> right. You're right, I agree. Um, hold on, Brother Paul. Let me get this other call in here. Let's yes. see what you want to have to say here. Peace. Peace. Greetings, peace. peace. Is this, is yes. this my line? Oh, this you. Peace, guys. Peace. How y'all doing? Peace. Oh, peace. Got it. Peace, peace, guys. Um, the God just asked, peace, Brother Noble Pop. Peace, God. Peace, peace, The God peace. just asked, what the fuck he crying for? We already know. One of the brothers shared with us that the Caucasian at his job said, I don't know why you happy y'all won. We ain't going to do nothing but take it out on y'all. And then also, too, they're taking away the gun laws. Y'all know how Caucasians are about their guns. So it's like, right now, I just want to give a shout-out to the past ancestors. Martin Luther King, Malcolm, Earl Ryan. I'm going to say his name three times like Beetlejuice. Malcolm, Earl Ryan, Malcolm, Earl Ryan. That's my oldest brother. I break him down on my website. I'm going to put his picture up there, too. Also, the website is in the work. It's a work in progress. We're not finished with it. There's a lot more that needs to be done. We just want to make sure it was out. I also want to give a shout out to Malcolm Shalom El Bay. He crossed over too for the energy of 2012, y'all. That energy is still resonating. And I also want to just take a moment out because it's a storm brewing. It's a storm brewing. I know in Georgia is one brewing here. I want us to just take deep breaths together and guard ourselves in gold light. When you take that deep breath, hold it for three seconds, and then exhale for six. There's some people out there that are suffering right now. The storm is whooping ass. I'm, I can I can hear it. So we're, with this garment of the gold light, right, it's going to keep us protected. Yep. It's going to make it so that what we think manifests. So let's keep breathing in deeply together, holding it for three. And exhale for six. Holding it for three. And exhale for six. And see that gold light, right? It keeps you protected. Yes, goddess. It also draws more positive energy. That's what it does. So anyway, I got an announcement too. Um, we have a female add on website Friday. It's from three to five. You can hit up covered for covered beauty on Facebook. We're gonna be teaching the women how to manifest more economics, helping y'all build your own website, showing y'all how to group purchase gold and silver, showing you how to group purchase everything. When we come together with our economics we can do more. Also, 
We have a conference on Sunday where everybody is invited. That's going to be at 9 o'clock, so 9 to 11. But I just want to just, you know, just add on to the conversation, and I'm going to pass it over to the gods. Um, y'all, anybody want to say anything? Yeah, please. Please, please oh, got us. Please got us. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, she actually, Brother um, Brother Aline, she actually, the goddess actually hit it on the head when it was talking about taking the guns away. Because if you remember in the ISIS paper, um, the, the doctor, she actually was saying how the gun is actually the European's penis. So right. now you're messing with the manhood. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what they're upset about. See, we, the Aboriginal and Indigenous, Native people, we don't have to worry about no gun because what they gonna come out. They don't have no laws against no bows and no crossbows. You see right. what I'm saying? We can we can go back to that. You know what I'm saying? The chattel knives and stuff. So we all right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You're right, brother Paul. No doubt about it. I'd like hey. to make a comment on the yeah, uh, about the uh, uh, President Barack Obama mm-hmm. uh, as regards. Uh, to the brother, what he said, what the fuck he's crying about. Uh, what the fuck he's crying about is because he knows what's getting ready to come down. Right. And he knows the, the gun control laws, uh, what they're planning on doing is confiscating everybody's weapons and destroying the Second Amendment. And once they do that, the other amendments are going to be destroyed, right? and including your Constitution, if 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 we allow it which I don't believe we are going to allow. Right, right. Well, I know there's a lot of threatening going on from Alex Jones, you know, and others saying that if they try to take the guns, it's going to be civil war in this country. And that's what Barack Obama is crying about. Yeah. Right. So we, we definitely know that for a fact because this already been stated um, by Alex Jones and many others um, from the NRA and different other groups. No doubt. Well, okay, well, so that's even, why those boys were sacrificed with the Skittles and the tea, and you see what I'm saying? Yes, and ma'am. Put that yeah. mess out. But you yes, know what? It. But but even but even at that, even if there was not to be any gun laws, right? Remember, who are the manufacturers for the bullets? Most of our people don't even much have no sweat here anyway to make their own bullets. You see, and I've been telling people for the longest. When you see bird shit, scoop it up. You know, I, I was telling them this. I say, when you see bird shit, scoop it up. Save it. Take it and put it in some canisters. But you think they won't listen? No. Bird manure. What you doing? Wait a minute. What you doing to bird shit? Get ready to tell you. Yeah. You know, it becomes gunpowder. <laughs> you see? Oh. But they was listening? No. So, hey, I think military minded me. <laughs> well, we all need to start thinking militarily minded. You know exactly. I know I need. Well, to you just it. dropped the jewel because <laughs> now we all now we all know that. Exactly. Yeah, because I mean it's real simple. Our ancestors, our our Moorish family over there in China, they was the ones that actually came up with the gunpowder from using bird feces and dealing with sulfur and everything to make gunpowder. You That's see, true. to make firecrackers. So you mm-hmm. don't need a bullet to do things because, actually, that's why I was like, I don't know why our family members and them went head on and trained with them to get guns with bullets and gunpowder when you had to take and put the gunpowder in the gun first. Then you got to push the gunpowder down, then put the bullet in there and pack the bullet in there. And I'm like, that's too much time. When you had an arrow, only thing you had to do was take it out out the holster, take it, shoot it, and then you can re- reuse the arrow. You know right. what I'm saying? Unless you break it off in the person. So I was like, what made them want to trade for a gun anyway? Because you can see it from long distance. Nah. You know, so it was way more than that. So I'm like, they can keep their guns. I don't even much need it. Well, they've been showing that a lot um, <laughs> here more lately, you know, on movies, you know, of um of um, people going back to arrows. You know, they got, um, you know, um, the arrow being shown in so many movies, I can't even think of all of them right now, you know, at this time, because mm-hmm. this subject, but, I mean, it's a real, 
you know, it's definitely something in which that people definitely need to investigate is learning archery. You know what I'm saying? I know I learned it back in the days, and I probably need to pick it back up. You know, but, um, you know, we all need to start um, doing something if, um, based on martial arts, um, the Montu arts, you know what I'm saying, to get back in tune. Yeah. But thanks, Brother Pa. Um, we're going to go back to the phone lines here. And we get, um, we get ready to bring on for the second half. Deborah? Yes, good night, Dr. Bay. Good night. Um, hold on. Let me see if the other caller is back yet. Okay. Ingredients. 773, area code 773. Yeah, it's back again. Okay. Peace. Okay. Peace. All right, thank you, Dr. Bay, for welcoming this interview. Tonight, we're graced with a seasoned author. His name is Dr. Gant, Dr. Anthony Gant, and his latest book is called Never Get Fired Again. Welcome, Dr. Gant, to the Dr. Bay Show. Thank, thank you for having me, Deb. I do appreciate it as well, Dr. Bay. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. I know that you can shed some light on helping people get through these difficult economic times, so we definitely thank you for having your presence here tonight. Dr. Gant, here's the scenario. Your ungrateful employer has just told you to take a lifetime vacation. That does not sit well with you. What should you do to sustain stability or to gain leverage in life? Well, when your employer tells you something like that, what you have to realize is that sometimes the outdoor may be the indoor. Sometimes when people put you out of their company, they really actually give you the chance to get in your own company and start your own business. Unfortunately, a lot of us that haven't been taught how to do that and we understand that having our own business is putting us in control of our working present as well as our working future. So the question that needs to be asked is how much control do I want to have over my working present and how much control do I want to have over my working future? Now, the more control you give up in your present, the less control you're going to have in your future. Exactly. And that's why we have a hard time understanding that we should be in business for ourselves. It's about control. Wow, thank you. That was thought provoking. Now, Dr. Gant, can you please inform our listeners of some of your former life experiences that may have encouraged you to write such a multi faceted book, Never Get Fired Again? What influenced you to write that book, Never Get Fired Again? Well, uh, I'm a business consultant and been an entrepreneur for uh, quite a while for uh, for a few years. And what I realized is that. I don't think I realized it as much because I've been an entrepreneur for so long. And when the recession came, uh, more people were forced to be out here in the entrepreneur world than I had been a part of for numerous years before that happened. And to me, it seemed like a normal way to do things as far as being an entrepreneur. But I've seen that uh, a lot of people, it wasn't new. To, it wasn't something that was old. Uh, it was a, a new thing to them. It was something that was revolutionary to them because they were forced out of the situation that they were in. So being that they were forced out of the situation that they had, they were in, they had to actually still make money or earn money from some type of uh, employment, but they couldn't get back into the job market. So I found out after the last three or four years, all the consulting that I've done, helping people start from where they are to get to where they want to be, and, uh, again, taking control over their working present as well as their working future, it helped me come up with the book uh, Never Get Fired Again because people – one thing you say about people that go and get a job, they say, I'm looking for job security. I, you know, I want to get, make sure my stuff is secure. But if you don't have control over it, it's not secure. It's almost being in the passenger seat, being in the passenger seat of someone else's car. You don't have control over the driving when you're not driving. You only have control over the driving of the car when you're driving the car. And so your security is in you driving, not in you riding. And that's the problem. That's what I end up coming up with and realizing that more people are so interested in riding in the front seat or riding in a good car, riding in a good company, so to speak, over being next to the boss, uh, being the assistant to the boss, not realizing it's best that you are the boss. So now you have security because you have control. Once again, <laughs> I definitely appreciate your answers and your insight to what's really going on. Thank you. Now, what are some of the benefits of becoming your own boss? Well, one of the benefits, obviously, again, like I've stated a couple of times, is having control. 
And when you have control, then that means in order to be in the driver's seat of your life, so to speak, you have to be willing to make decisions. So you have to be a decision maker because every business, uh, everything that happens in a business is made by a decision maker. Now, if you're working for someone else and they say that you have to go, this is your last day, that decision was made by a business person. It was made by someone else that's a business person. So that means that the problem that we have that was that a lot of people are afraid to make decisions about their own future. They're afraid to make decisions about their own present. In other words, they're afraid to take control of what they what they can do and the skills that they have. And since they lack that decision-making ability, then they put themselves in a position where somebody else is going to make the decision for you. Now, the person that makes the decision for you won't put you first. The person that's making the decision for you is putting themselves first. So they're not thinking about your family first. They're not thinking about your parents. They're not thinking about your kids' education. They're not thinking about your house note. They're not thinking about your car note. They're not thinking about your grocery bill. They're not thinking about your life bill. Because they're, when they make their decision, they're making that decision for them first. So my thing is, why don't you get in the driver's seat and think about making the decision for yourself first, for your family, for your house note, for your mortgage, your, your car payment, and everything else that goes along with it. Why? Because if I make the decision for me first and my family can depend on me, they can trust me, they can, make, they can rely on me. Don't rely on other people more than you rely on yourself. If that's the case, you have just given up control, and the more control you give up in your present, the less control you're going to have in your future. Definitely. Now, being as though it takes money to acquire money, how can one acquire the set of money to build their own business? Okay, and that's usually a, a, a big issue for a lot of people because they say, I want to get into business for myself. I always tell people, you look at the, the word, word to the word business, is B-U-S-I, miss, right? But really that's B Z. Yeah. And see, the problem is with a lot of people, they don't realize that being in business, you're going to be busy. And if you want to be in business, you can't be lazy. Lazy people need not apply to get in business. Not, so I don't care how much money you have. If you're lazy, you won't be in business long anyway. So if you, the, the issue of having money, what people need to understand in business, because I started businesses from the ground up, uh, just like a lot of other people, people have done, and one thing that you need more than money is customers. And if you don't know how to go find customers each and every day and you don't know how to take care of the customers that you found the days before today, you're going to be out of business, and I don't care how much money I give you. You'll run through that money just as quick. Some people run through a million dollars in 30 days. Some people will take a year. Some people will take five years. And the reason being, they don't know how to go find customers. It's all about customers. And why is that so important, Deborah? Because customers yeah. have what? Money. money. They have money. And that's what I need. I need money. If I have money and no customers, I'm going to still be out of business. If I have customers and money, I can stay in business. So the first objective is to find customers for your business. If you can't find customers, then you should not be in business until you learn how to find customers each and every day. Now, what if one lacks strong people skills? For example, they have a fear of conflict. Would we right. rise that person to create their own business? Well, see, again, it goes back to saying you've got to be a decision maker. And, yeah, you're going to have conflict, but you have conflict on jobs. People still go work them, though. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't run away from a job because they're going to have a conflict. There's going to be somebody at that company that they don't like and don't like them and don't like women, don't like men, don't like old people, young people, and all the other things that go along with it. But that don't stop them from pulling out an application to work a job. So why should it stop them from running the business? Yeah, you're going to have some – you need to develop your people skills. That's one of the five things that I tell people you need to have with any business. You have to develop people skills, people skills with your customers, and people skills with business people. If you can't develop people skills, then your customers going to feel like, you know, you're not taking care of them or that you don't want them to be around. If you don't develop business skills with suppliers, then you're going to hurt yourself there because you're going to have people that don't want to deal with you and supply you what you need to sell the customers. So that's something in business you have to always be refining yourself, and you have to become always more educated. In other words, Deborah. You have to get yeah. to the point where you are uh, so sold on learning that you're going to pay for learning. Why? See, because when you make learning your master, then that means you're refusing to make ignorance being a slave to ignorance. And that's what people real, don't realize. They're slaves to their ignorance because they, they refuse to make learning their master. And once you make learning your master, you don't mind paying for learning because the more you know, the less ignorant you become. So you have to always be open to investing yourself. Always. That's why we call it knowledge. 
If you look at the last three, four letters of the word knowledge, it's edge. We, you only as sharp as what you know. If you don't know very much, you're not that sharp. And if you want to get sharper than you are, that means you need to hang around people that's sharper than you are. Because it won't be long before you become sharper than you are. Because you'll be around people that have an edge on them. Not an edge of being rude, arrogant, discontent or anything of that nature, but an edge of knowing what they're doing, knowing what they're talking about. It'll make you sharper as you stay around those people. But here's the problem, Deborah. A lot of people don't want to hang around people that's sharp. They want to hang around a lot of people that's dull. They want to hang around people that don't know much because then there's no challenge. There's no expectation of you have to be smarter than you were the last time I talked to you. You might be doing better this year than you were last year, last time I seen you. But if I hang around a bunch of dull people that aren't that interested in making, learning, and master, well, we can be just as dumb as I was last year because you're not going to challenge me to be smarter. So that means that you have to get around people that's smarter than you so that you can become smarter than you. As they say, iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron, that's right. Now, how can we knowledge seekers purchase your books, your various books? I know you authored up to 14 books. Yes, so I know you have. How can we go about purchasing those books? Well, obviously they can contact me at different places. I was um, just this past summer, I was voted through the Black Business Network, I was voted the uh, 2012 Black Speaker of the Year. And, um, Congratulations. A lot of, thank you very much. And uh, the Black Business Network, uh, is, uh, that's one of the only places I allow to carry my books besides myself. But then that, they can all email me at Dr. Tony Gant, G-A-N-T-T, at gmail.com if they want any of my products or obviously if they want to talk to me, I try to make myself very accessible for those who want to learn. Something that I know. I don't know everything. I just know everything that I wrote in my books, but I don't know everything. So I just try to share what I know. Can you give us some insight? Can you give us a list of some of the books on which you've written? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, the, obviously the latest one is Never Get Fired Again, How to Have 100% Job Security. Uh, I've written a book in con- uh, entitled uh, I Love Me. It's how to build a uh, strategy to build healthy self-esteem. Another book that I've written is entitled uh, You Too Can Write a Book. I show you how Baby. to take everything, you know, take out, take it out of your head and out of your heart, and put it on paper. Uh, I've written a book entitled "Paid to Talk: How to Be a Paid Professional Speaker," uh, "Moving My Life: How to Stop Procrastinating and Start Progressing," and that book is very powerful because it's it, see a lot of times, Deborah, a lot of us would talk a better game than we play. And what I mean by that, we we'll talk about all the things we want to do, all the things we want to have, all the places we want to go, all the things we want to be. But we do, we do so much talking that we think our conversation is going to bring, it back, bring a realization. But it won't. It's called action. We have the activity. See, until you change your activity, then you can start accomplishing things. So first you change your mentality, then you change your activity, and then you can change your reality. But if your reality won't change if your activity stays the same, meaning that your mentality is still the same. So what happens is a lot of people procrastinate, by putting off what they can do today, they're trying to put it off to tomorrow. But then when tomorrow will come, they do the same thing when tomorrow turns into today. They're trying to put it off tomorrow, into, uh, putting what they still do today off to tomorrow. But then when that tomorrow will come and turn into it today, they do the same thing. And then they look back after a week, after a month, after a year, after a decade, and you say, what have you done the last 10 years? And they look so despondent. They have so much regret because they haven't done very much because they procrastinated a whole lot. So that's a great book to help people, whatever thing, that, whatever they're doing, just learning more about your your history, learning more about your your uh, your your the business, or learn how to raise your kids better, whatever it may be. Not to stop procrastinating. So I like to say it like this: history, H I S T O R Y. I heard a lot of that on the call tonight. A lot of history, which was really really good. But I always tell people put a hyphen between the I and the S, Deborah, and then it's called high story. See, if you don't know your high story, you're going to live a low life. Mm-hmm. And that's what people don't understand about knowing their history or high story. So, so many people live such a low life, and it's all because they don't know their high story, their history. So I appreciate what you all doing on the call because you're sharing a high story to prevent people from living such a low life. So that's some of the books that I've written. Now, Dr. Gant, you're also a paid speaker. Yes. 
What are some of the questions that one should ask themselves prior to deciding to become a paid speaker? I know you have well, a book on becoming a paid speaker. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, one, one thing, Deborah, that if people want to become a paid speaker, I always tell people when I train them and even when I coach people on becoming paid professional speakers, I said that the first thing, you have to have, have, have to have a heart for people. You have to care about people. If you don't care about people, don't get don't come in this profession because you'll mess people up. You get you get blinded by money because there's a lot of it to be earned in this profession. But it has to be about helping people be better, become better people than they are. It's about helping people become do better than what they do. If it's not about people, then you're actually hurting those people and you're hurting yourself. So I like to tell people, in order to get into the paid the, the professional speaker realm, you need to know how to you know turn your message or your mess into a message. The root word to the word message is mess. What mess have you been in and been out of? What mess did you go in with your personal relationships? What mess have you been in with your finances or whatever it may be? Well, if you learn something from it, now you can turn that mess into a message. That means that when you turn your mess into a message, it can massage the lives of the people that hear you. And if anybody ever got a massage before, Deborah, just one time, nobody gets upset with a massage. They don't get mad at the person that gave them a massage and said, you messed up my life. You made me feel better than I felt before I met you. Oh, my goodness, that pain that I had is gone. It is your fault. No one gets upset with a massage. So if you have a message and that came from a mess that you learned how to get out of, now you can massage the lives of the people that hear you. And now they don't mind paying you for what you know because they don't know it yet and they want to learn it. So people are handing over money to you to know what you know if you're willing to teach, teach them what you know, because they're willing to learn it. So one of the things, to go back, Deborah, you have to actually have a heart for people first. It can't just be about money, because it's just about money. You know, go out there and work a job. Go out there and do something else just for money. But it has to be about helping people become better and do better. And that translates into a powerful outcome, definitely. Thank you. Now, do you have a formula in which you apply in regards to your business of becoming or being a paid speaker? Yeah, what, one thing that I use, I use a four-step formula. For the first 10 years, Deb, I've been I've been in the speaking business close to, well, probably over 20 years now, but uh, for the first 10 years of my speaking career, somewhere around there, I, I made no money. I, I didn't get paid. Good thing I, I was doing something else at the time, uh, but I earned no money from being a paid professional speaker. As a matter of fact, Deb, if someone would have given me a check, you know what I would have done? I would have cashed it. Right. Yeah, I would have done that. You know, and I don't think I was right speaking all those right on the spot. That's right. And I don't think I was speaking all those years not to get paid. However, that's the first way I got paid. Somebody did give me a check and I cashed it. But it was ten years, and most people can't last ten years. Like I said, fortunately enough for me, I had some other things going on. Otherwise, I would have starved to death. You know, I was a single dad raising two kids. I Man, we would have we've been in trouble, right? So what I did learn is. Uh, how to get paid, but I, I, I end up finding something out that there's a lot of money in the industry, right? And if you're not careful, you know, your motives can become unjust. They can become impure because of the fact that you're blinded by the money because you can earn thousands of dollars in a matter of a couple of hours because of the fact of the industry that you're in. So I had to come up with a formula to make sure my motives stayed pure and I stayed on track and I did what I was going, going up there to do and I actually help people with what they do. So the first, I have a four-step formula, and it's a it's paid. It's an acronym for paid, P-A-I-D. And the P in that paid is for problem. you got to find a problem. But you don't find a problem just to go around telling everybody about the problem. Nobody's going to pay you just because you found a problem. Some people don't know problems even exist, so they don't even care if, if there is a problem. However, after you find a problem, you need to find answers. That's what the A is. And you need to find as many answers as you can come up with to the problems that do exist. People don't mind giving you a little money if you can find an answer to a problem. But it, the I is for instruct. You must instruct people on how to apply the answers you have to the problems that they have. If you can't instruct me on how to apply the answers that you gave me to the problems that I have, I'm in the same situation having the problem without the answer because I don't know how to apply your answers that you gave me. And the D is to dedicate yourself to this, to this, dedicate your, dedicate yourself to this process more than you're dedicated to money and you get paid. So I call that the paid formula, which is trademarked by me, but it's called the paid formula. And that's what I use for the last decade or so to keep me focused on, on why I'm there and what I'm supposed to do in the process. Paid as in the people problem 
A for answer, I for instruct, and D to dedicate. Good luck. Okay. Now, Dr. Gant, you are a seasoned speaker. Do you have any audio programs? And if so, how can we go about purchasing them? Uh, the same, uh, yeah, I do have audio programs on how to be a paid speaker. I have audio programs on Never Get Fired Again, which is about eight hours. Um, I have an audio program on all the products that I actually have. I have audio programs on them, and obviously people can contact me directly uh, because you can, uh, you can only get the best deal from the source, which is me. But they can contact me directly and get, and um, and they contact me directly and they can get that information uh, personally from me by just contacting uh, Dr. Tony Gant uh, at gmail dot com and then uh, let me know what program they want. They want to know more information about them. Uh, they can, and uh, obviously I do several different conference calls, you know, for people all over the United States. I learn how to do some of the things that I've been, been fortunate enough to be able to do. Well, thank you, Dr. Gant, and thank you, Dr. Bay, again for welcoming this interview, and thank you, Dr. Gant, for expressing your wealth of knowledge tonight. We definitely appreciate it. Once again, we spoke to Dr. Gant, Dr. Tony Grant, on Never Get Fired Again, his latest book. Dr. Gant, we have some people, too, that have been in the chat room asking about how to get your book, so that's great that they'll be able to listen. We have about um, 4,000 downloads, and the concept of economics is powerful. It's a powerful vibration. It kicked off in Florida, and we're going to keep that vibration going. So this is just on point. We have some very intelligent listeners, plus members of the Wealth Builders team that listen, and also shouts out to the students in the Healing Wings Institute class. Now, um, you wouldn't be opposed to those who purchase your book or your audios to donate to the temple, would you? No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be opposed to anybody purchasing them and donate them in, uh, anywhere they want to. I mean, all, okay. all they have to do is call me. I'm pretty, I'm pretty accessible. Uh, they just need to call me out if I'm in, a, in, in some type of meeting, a training, or something. I can't get you right away, but I'm really accessible. I have assistants to work with me on uh, some of the emails, so I can make sure I can answer as many as I can as quickly as I can. That's beautiful. Also, um, it seems like you have a um, a question, but you can donate for the um, for a percentage of the sales that you accumulate from the show at dralimelbay dot com, and we really appreciate those vibrations. Um, this forum, like I said, has over four thousand downloads in a week, so just powerful. <laughs> The vibration right. is really powerful. Now, you do have a question in the chat room, area code. Okay. 302. Oh, this is the family. Area code 302. Peace, peace, peace and love. Peace, peace and love, God. Yeah, this um Messiah, as he's ill. calling in. Um, you know, just bigging up the brother for his demonstration on economics and how we all need to be our own bosses, which is what we're going to be promoting the same type of thing at this temple here, Temple Number Two F in Laurel, Delaware. Um, we're trying to secure economics for all members that come in, and that way we can be our own bosses and then in turn be able to focus on learning or knowing and spirituality and things of that nature. So, you know, I just want to give you a, a shout-out in regard to that um, on your demonstration. And also anybody who is in the area who is interested, I also want to get in, I need some of your literature and your, and your audio and stuff like that. I need to get in touch with you and, and, and purchase some of that because I want to bring that to the table here. Okay. And anyone who is in the area of Delaware, we um down in southern Delaware, uh, we Temple Number 2F, which is located at 513 Pine Street, Laurel, Delaware. We have an email address, which is Moorish Holy Temple of Science 2F at Gmail. We also will be in April doing a grand opening when Aleem and Kadir will come down and demonstrate, and a few other guest speakers will going to come down and demonstrate as well. And our phone number is area code 302-236-3781. That's 302-236-3781. My name is Messiah, or Sheik is Crystal. Powerful. I know we're definitely going to be there. Absolutely. And that was um, Moore's Holy Temple 2F as in Father? Yes, 2F. 
Morris Holy Temple of Science, 2F at Gmail. Dot com. Dot com, correct. I'm looking forward to hearing from a lot of people and continuing on to further our economic structure in our society, period. Appreciate you, Brother Messiah, for coming on. Yes, oh, I definitely appreciate you. <laughs> yes, um, we also appreciate you, Brother Gant, for um, giving out that information, excellent information on economics and how we need to actually move to that realm because we actually were, um, my wife, Messiah, his wife, all of us were at a conference called the Summit of the Moors, and we was building on economics, um, in particular economics dealing from land to aquaponics, hydroponics, um, organic gardens, and et cetera. You know, we was building on it from every aspect in which that you also was referring to and talking about. So economics is definitely the move for today, and we definitely need to be moving towards that. Um, so we definitely want your information once again before you go. Um, can you please get that to us? Yeah, not a problem. I definitely can. I do appreciate the opportunity. And I like the fact that you all talking about economics. And I just say this brief moment that, see, I, I, I share a lot of things with people to help them. You know, a lot of people say they want to be millionaires and things of that nature, and that's wonderful. And uh, once you know the system is not like it's that difficult to, to accomplish that, uh, to be worth seven figures. However, I tell people, before we get people become millionaires, let's help a whole lot of people become thousandaires. Right. What do I mean? Right. I mean? What I mean by that? Because, you know, I do seminars on finances all the time and different audiences. And I always start with the question, how many of you all in 2012 or whatever year it may be, how many of you all have saved at least $1,000 in the last 12 months? Now, it's no indictment if you didn't, but how many have? And it's really about 20% of the audience at best. So that means that 8 out of 10 people, unfortunately, wasn't able to sell, uh, save $1,000 last year. Now, that doesn't mean that something is wrong with them. That's not the issue. It may be something wrong with the plan that they have. That's the issue. That's what's broken, not them. We just need to fix the plan that they have. So what I tell people, let's make them thousandaires, because once I see how they earn, you know, become a thousandaire, then you become a multiple thousandaire, and eventually you become a ten thousandaire, and you become multiple ten thousandaires, and eventually you become a hundred thousandaire, and then you become multiple hundred thousandaires, and then eventually you become millionaires, and then you do that again a couple of times, you become multi multi millionaire. So the, the thing of knowing about how the, how money works, how to work the money, I don't care how old you are from the time you start dealing with money, and I don't care how old, old you get, you're going to have to deal with money. So doesn't it make sense? Now just think about this for a moment. Doesn't it make sense that that should be a priority, that we know how money works? I didn't say fall in love with money. Just know how it works because I don't know, I don't care how old I get, I am going to need to have money. I'm going to need to buy groceries. I'm going to need to put gas in my car. I'm going to need to, you know, buy soap. I'm going to need to buy something, food. So it doesn't make sense that we know something about money. So I appreciate the fact that you all are talking about economics. I'm glad that I was able to share some things about being your own boss and things of that nature. But, um, and, and hopefully I get another opportunity in the future to share some more information with you that I know. Don't know everything. I just know what I know, and I just try to share that with as many people as I possibly can. Um, definitely, you will be back again. Um, that's no doubt about that, and we would love to have you back for a full show um, speaking on economics and um, actually having our own summit um, conference on economics online here um, where everyone can get a chance in order to learn more about real economics and the science of making money, um, having money, and doing what we need to do properly with it. Um, you know, we need food, clothing, and shelter. Um, but we need to be manufacturing our clothes, in which right. um, we don't, you know, and problems um, with us people is getting to that aspect, building to that aspect. Um, every time in which that we have someone to come forth, they end up selling a company, whether it's FUBU, Call Kanai, or et cetera. Um, after they come out for about five years or so, um, they get bought out, the company then eventually knows anything else about it. Right. That's true. That's true. And that's something that, like you said, Doc, that we have to get more enforced into the manufacturing side. See, the, the person that produces something, 
is all, it has more control than anybody else. Exactly. Depends. Mm-hmm. You produce the clothing. You set the price. You set the price. That means that you have control. If you just buy the clothing, and I mean, I, it's unfortunate that FUBU and places like that sold out. Uh, I mean, I don't like it, but, you know, it is what it is. But we need to teach more of us how to produce them. Eventually, we will produce the cars. We'll produce a whole lot of things if you give us enough time and give us enough money. It's enough of, It's enough black people that on, on the, on, in the United States of America, just for that fact, that know how to produce something. They, don't, they may not have the, the money, so to speak, but they know how to produce a computer just as well as Apple. They're not to produce telephones just as better, just as good as Motorola. So that means that we have to get good at supporting these people with these great ideas and supporting people that has the heart to strike out their own, their own and say, I'm going to be in business for myself. I don't care if it's making food or making clothing or making shoes or making you know, building houses. I'm going to strike out on my own. And then we must support that group of people that, that strike out on their own because if we support them, then those that don't want to be in business for themselves can have a job waiting on them. Yeah, because um, here we are looking at the inventor of the cell phone, Henry Sampson. Do mm-hmm. he get any credit for us making the cell phone? And this is a brother, once again, who designed and put together the cell phone, and here it is being a multi-billion dollar industry. Do we, right. do we think that his family get any of that, you know, <laughs> any royalties for that or anything? I mean, it's just like, you know, um, George Washington Carver, you know, died, you know, a pauper, died, you know what I'm saying, with no money. That's you right. know, um, I mean, we look at Philip M. U. Wally, you know, who is actually the father of the Internet. You know, uh-huh. do he get any recognition for being um, the one to come up with the idea of HTTP, in which that, in a sense, that stands for HOTEP, <laughs> you know, or one in which they put together um, the design for the internet service, you right. know, again, this is a brother, you know, so um, we have to begin to start um, patting our um, ideas and our, right. ideas. you know, that's the first step is patting them so that um, when someone comes along, we can still um, reap the um, reap the benefits, um, even if we choose to, um, you know, I guess sell our design or whatever the case may be. There should be a clause in there that we should still have some type of share or something. I mean, because this is ridiculous. Because this 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 thing about us not having no distribution companies, um, not having any type of um, major manufacturing or corporations, you know, in the sense of doing um, import and export internationally. This this is something in which that definitely has to stop. We have to come into. Um, I mean, you, brother um, Claude Anderson, and others. Um, is hitting on the right points, and this is something that if we follow um, black power of, um, you know, of um, economics, you know, up under Amos Wilson, you know, and start to really look into what he was saying, too, mm-hmm. um, I think that we can definitely be where we need to be at. Okay. Dr. Grant, the thousand heirs, are y'all dealing with compounding interest? Or foreign exchange currencies? Well, I don't deal with the foreign exchange currency. Not that uh, it's not good. Uh, I'm one of these that, and the more you listen to me, and the more you, you you know, we talk, I'm one of these elementary type people, and I'm big on if you want to look smart, learn to take something complicated and make it simple. Mm-hmm. And perhaps if you want to look like a genius, make sure simple things don't get complicated. So I teach very simple, basic truths. Because before people can step into these higher realms of things, they need to get the basics done. Right. Before a, a, a before a person can dance real good, they better be able to walk pretty good first. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Before they start break dancing and, and doing flips and twists and everything, they better get pretty good at knowing how to walk, knowing how to stand. And that's really where I most of my focus is on. Because I realized years ago, my sister, that sometimes I I would talk to people like I'm talking to giraffes. You understand what I'm saying? I'll be talking that way up here, and I'm missing them because they're way down there. That's not saying they're bad. I just wasn't meeting them where they are because, you know, I, I can talk on some things on wealth and how to become worth seven figures, but most people don't want to become worth seven figures. They say they do, but they really don't. But they really just want to have enough money to get financially ahead. They just want to make sure that, hey, they got enough money to pay all their bills and maybe save a little money and maybe do a few extra things. And if that's what 
they desire, that's okay. That's not a bad thing. However, I can show you some millionaires that I train right now today that had millions of dollars and lost it. And why did they lose it? Not because they had the million dollars. They lost it because they didn't know the basics. They didn't know how to actually work the basics of everything. And so they were out there doing things, and the million dollars looked good when they had it, but as quickly as they got it, they lost it because they didn't know the basics of money. They didn't know the basics of how the money works. They didn't know the basics of how to invest. And, you know, I tell people, my sister, that everybody should have what I call SSI. It's not an SSI check. It's what you do as SSI with money. And what I mean is S, spend some. The second S, save some. And the third S, invest some. Make sure you do that with your money. That's your SSI. Spend some, save some, invest some. And then you might have to start small in your investment and your savings. And then, you know, your spending may be out of whack right now. But then we want to eventually get down. Our spending is low, our saving is high, and our investment is even higher. I say, I love that. And on our Wealth Builders team, because we trust and honor each other and we've been dealing with each other a long time, we know each other, we come together, too, with our economics and invest. So we definitely spend some, we share some, spend some, <laughs> save some, and invest. I like that. Um, so I want to invite you, too, if you can, on Sunday at 9 o'clock to our Wealth Builders Conference. It will also be via blog talk, but you'll also get a chance to, you know, um, meet some other wealth builders because we can handle the seven figures because we need to do the aquaponics. shout out to Brother Sanyata, 12. We also need to do the schools. We also need to do, you know, grocery stores. And um, we're ready, you know, but you're right. Everybody's not, and we want, that's what we want to do. We want to bring them up, you know, because it's currency, it's energy and motion, and I want to see them with. And right. once we have more, black and more have more, then the world will be a better place, especially, you said, if they have the basics. Because we're the oldest indigenous people on the planet. Got big right. hearts, just got to learn this economics thing. Right. I'm so grateful right. that this energy is resonating. Um, the Mayans brought the energy, the Olmecans brought the energy in 2012, you know, so it's resonating. And we can feel yeah. like the change, yeah. you know. Um, let's see if we have any other questions or comments. Um, so all you got to do is press one comment, a question, you know, on any topic. Love to hear from y'all. Brother um, Rosalind L., you ain't said nothing. <laughs> Uh, silver and gold. You the um, you know what too? The Chinese have dropped some gold. Okay, they put it in the market. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your perspective on that, brother Doctor Gant? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear your last question. Go ahead. Your perspective on the Chinese on the, on China backing their money with gold. Have you heard that again? Yes. Yeah, well, everybody tried to, well, obviously back then you uh, research money, you know, everybody, that's what money used to be bagged back to. The money was only good as the gold you had. You know, now it's a little bit inflated because of certain things. But uh, he, here's what I, I, I share with people all the time, that, you know, sometimes you don't know where to go and what to do with the money, and that's okay. That's not a problem. But I say follow the little old man. And if the little old man is doing it, for instance, if big people are putting big money in places, you may not have ten million dollars to put into that same thing, but do you have a hundred dollars to put into that same thing? Because the big, the, the little old man is not going to put ten million, twenty million something, and not expect to get some type of good return from it. So follow the little old man, because the little old man is actually putting where he can get a lot of dollars. And you may again, you may put your hundred dollars in there, you may not get ten million back. But you may get double, which is 200. You may get triple, but you have to follow a little old man, meaning you have to be astute to what's going on. Because the word currency, I heard you say it earlier, is movement. That's what it means, movement. And money does not attach itself to people that don't move. Mm-hmm. It attaches itself to move. It, 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 it's a moving thing. So currency is moving. The question I ask people, are you moving? Not just like physically moving. Are you mentally moving? Are you physically moving? Because money attaches itself to a moving pieces. And people that don't want to move and want to sit around and, and, and maybe they want to be lazy as, to a certain degree, the money can't attach to you because you're not moving. So you got to be moving, following the little old man, like you said, doing some things that you, you're saying yourself, 
you know, like following, you know, the gold or, and just well builders and connected with you all. I mean, I, you know, it's the first time I've been on the phone with you all. And, it's, you know, it's a lot of energy here, and I'm, you know, I'm thankful that you all are on doing what you're doing and trying to help as many people as possible. But more and more people need to connect with uh, with you all and then find out, hey, if I don't know, they know. Hey, if you're in a, if you're in a car and we're driving from New York to Florida and you're in the car with me and I'm driving, we, you know we both get to Florida at the same time. So I'll do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. I mean, you just jump, you jump in the car with some people that's moving, and then they get a little tired. They say, can you drive an hour? You drive an hour. But because you're in the car with them, you're going to get to Florida at the exact same time they get to Florida. That's the wonderful part about it, getting around people that are smarter than, and they're willing to share information with you about finance or spiritual things or whatever it may be. They're willing to share that with you. Get with those people. Rub up against those people because who you hug up on, you're going to smell like. Yeah, and if you like what these people that or the, the, what you all are doing, people need to hug up with you. So they can smell like you. And then we got two people smelling good, not just one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, shoot, I remember the um, the handsome old man that I met at, um, when I worked. Help us add on. Because um, we had, we've had a store for 13 years now. We were sleeping on the floor in our store. We was humble with it. And I was working waitress, and I was making good money, and I had a little hustle in me because I would sell the cigarettes for a dollar, and I would sell lighters and whatever, but I met a lot of great people. So a lot of people have nine to fives, and I always tell y'all, y'all can use y'all nine to five steady income in order to invest with. That's right. And, um, save some, and invest some. Well, he taught me to share some. Every time he got something to drink, he would give me the same amount of the tip. It was a 100% tip. So I was just... I was just so excited about the fractions and stuff. So I also want to encourage the family to teach their children. My mother had me selling candy in high school, and I had people selling candy with me. And I also um, sold rainbow vacuum cleaners. So I've always had the hustle in me. You know, so encourage that in your babies, the economic values. I even seen this lady um, show her son how to um, pay the bills and um you know, online, just it's so easy. Just incorporate them. And um, so if you're moving, like the brother was saying, if you're moving, then it makes it easier to invest. It's even easier. You know, just change some things. Like don't, yeah. um, get, it, don't um, get the name brands or, um, you know, go to some thrift stores. And you could, you could um, loosen up the money for clothing, you see what I'm saying, and put it somewhere else just for a moment because once you invest, It'll start making things change for you. You know, Bill right. Con came to Fayetteville and got some seven hundred dollars stocks, and people were hating. But his, he he sacrificed. I'm sure everybody got to sacrifice, right. you know, to get what they want. So definitely move. Yeah, definitely <laughs> move. Uh, if, if I may say something here, uh, one thing we have to do, especially number one thing we have to do, is have the real understanding what money is and what money isn't. That's right. You know, uh, if we think, what most people think anyway, uh, I know Eileen know and Sister Kadira know, I know, I don't know if you know or not, uh, if we think that what most people think what money is, then all of our understanding about what uh, about money is wrong. Right. Because, because if we stay on that, uh, kind of thinking and understanding what money is, which it isn't, then we'll never have any control or real control of our own economy and 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 and, um, and wealth. Right. You, you follow me so far? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's why I was stressing on the silver and gold. Uh, real money can only be real only if it's backed by silver and gold. That's it. So far, it's been backed by our own energy and labor. But that's going to come. Uh, it, 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 it can only go so far. You know, you, you you cannot never pay a debt with another debt. It always fails. Always. That's my. That's my input. And you have 
absolutely right, God, you know. And that's why we are group purchasing gold and silver. If you want to know, just go to the website, put in the um, box that you was inspired by the by the Grand Sheik to get in the group. <laughs> come up, come with your fifty dollars or your hundred, and you know, let's make it happen. That's another thing too that I love about the um, Born Connians, the Tianos, misnomered the Mexicans, because they they will get in that car to Florida. And they will be six and seven <laughs> So I just love how they just come together, you know. And also too, um, the you know, the so called Jews, you know. The communities and stuff that the brothers talk about, creating our own communities, also in our hearts and in our minds. So what'll help it in our hearts is meditation. And using utilizing our magic, burning candles, um, you know, um, our breathing techniques. As a matter of fact, there's a um, there's a conference in Philadelphia, Brother Noble Paz told us about. The sister talking about breathing. You know, um, definitely make that if you can. Um, we're also gonna be in Virginia for um, the Blackamore Month, cause y'all know Blackamore History Month is coming up. So if you can get into these schools, because this is this is a time where they are welcoming this type of stuff. You know, you go in there with your hair wrap on, dashikis and stuff. You know, as a matter of fact, um, the crystal, um, Grand Sheik is crystal. I know y'all in there. Goddess, you got to add on too before we conclude. Peace, peace. I'm here. Peace. Peace. <laughs> peace. Yes, the sister is doing a special light vibration. She is um, right now planning how we can make things better for the youth. If you could just add on, Goddess, please. Well, ultimately, my goal is to create um, home-based economics in reference to um, products that are chemical-free so that our children don't have to worry about such things as uh, fluoride and the other chemicals that are polluting our bodies, Um, basically increasing their intelligence and making them more successful as they grow. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to show them that, you know, not only did I not complete college, however, I am intelligent, but what I did was I completely decided that what I wanted to do was um, completely independent. I work for people. I've been laid off twice. I've never been fired. However, I'm tired. I don't want to be laid off anymore, so I completely felt the brother where he was coming from, and I completely support that as well. Um, I'm not saying don't educate yourself either. There are other ways of education, Um, although I did go to several different schools and I have certificates and other things. um, You can put those things into your own businesses and build home economics at home, and I want the babies to know that, and that goes for my son and everyone else's son and all the sons out there. Well, good, because my prayer is for all the sons out there too. Sister, that was powerful. That was powerful. Please add on if you have any questions, comments. Now, see, that's the that's the energy that you're gonna be meeting in April with their grand opening. Could you um break that out too? True. The grand opening is just gonna be an event. Um, it's a gathering of family, not just a gathering of my family, but our extended family, meaning all of you. You are all invited. I plan on feeding everybody, and that's the best way to bring my family to me is just let y'all experience my cooking, my art. Um, we plan on raffling off some of my blankets. I make homemade blankets, pillows, T-shirts. Um, we are also opening a store in reference to the temple as well. We'll be giving away gift bags from the store. Um, we plan on doing a lot of charity work as well through the temple um, as far as having, you know, soup dinners throughout the month, you know, giving out clothes to the needy and just, you know, bringing people in and just educating them and giving them the knowledge that they need to succeed and go further in this life and further us as a people. I love it. On the same team. Who I love it. Mm. Okay, that's powerful. Yeah, people are coming. And y'all can also start getting y'all raffle tickets now. That'll be powerful. You definitely want them hand-knitted blankets. The goddess is off the chain with that. T-shirts, all of that. Beautiful. So any other things that you wanted to add on? No, I'm just just loving the food I got this evening. I'm just loving the food and loving the information and just absorbing everything from everyone. Good, good. So they're going to have their website up soon. It's going to be the temple. Family been asking where is the temple in that area, so they manifesting it. We They're building up. So if you're getting inspired, then, um, you know, just let us know. Hook up with us on the website. It's Dr. Aleem. 
L Bay. Some people have been forgetting the L Bay. That's E L. That's the masculine force and power. Dr. Aleem L Bay dot com. And hit us up with your questions. We'll respond. Um, brother, um, brother Wilton and L, you got anything else you want to say before we close out, God? Uh, yes, yeah, sister. Uh, goddess. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, as I say again, <clears throat> as far as uh. Dealing with foreign currency, anything like that. Well, when you're talking about you talking about China, uh, well, China. Uh, this is the reason why the U.S. U.S. corporation is in debt to China, because their currency is backed by gold, and the U.S. is not. So they're in debt with them. That's why I stress the emphasis on silver and gold. That's the key to our e- economic success. That's all I have to say on that note. Okay. Well, that's true. That's true. So get your goal with us, family. You know, fifty dollars, um, you'll get one hundred and twenty-five dollars worth of silver. Um, hundred dollars, you get two hundred and fifty dollars worth of silver. It's just that easy. Okay. Um, so hook up with us. We got a conference call this weekend, Friday and Sunday. So we're making it available. We're gonna show you how to create dough. It don't get no easier than that. All right, peace, love, light, honor, and respect to everyone, and we'll see y'all Friday. All right, peace and love. Peace, peace and love. See y'all Friday. All right, peace and love. Peace, peace and love. First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this is, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works.